the hour of 1.30 having arrived, we will call to order this meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. Clerk, please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Newsom. Present. Brown. Here. Watkins. Here. Bruner. Present. Helen Tory Johnson. Present. Vice Mayor Golder. Here. And Mayor Keeley. Here. A quorum having been established, we will move forward on our agenda. Uh, what we're going to do at this point is take public comment on any item that is on our closed session agenda. So this is your opportunity. We have uh, given you uh, five minutes on this. Uh, Ms. Rowe, good afternoon. Well, as you know, my name is Nancy Rowe. I'm a 70-year-old widow on Social Security, and I live at 211 Trevithan. A gentleman came out to change out my meter, came to my door, then disappeared. Then another gentleman came out from the city and said that I had a major um, water leak under my rocks as my water well bill was very high. And he said I should fix it as soon as possible as not to incur more money. <laughs> And then um, I called the people to come out and do it. He did tell me it would be between eight and nine thousand dollars, which he was correct in that. <coughs> um, and I had fellows come out. They dug an unnecessary trench, looked at my pipes. They were fine. And the gentleman from Bellows went to my water meter and cleaned it out and discovered the leak was on the city side. Um, it was during the storm, so that's when he did that. Uh, he said my pipes were fine. No problem there. Uh, okay, and then, um, they, they, then uh, they refilled the trench. You know, and meanwhile, I was waiting for a smart meter to come in. And it finally came in. And uh, of course, it was that I had absolutely no leak. And um, this process took six weeks. And my sister and I usually sit on the front porch. So she was with that, me when all this stuff was set. And, you know, it's not fun to look at a French on my porch. <laughs> porch. So, uh, yeah, and then, um, you know, I finally had to you know, they did the trench in, and my concern is that I took out a loan to do this, which I am on Social Security, so quite a bit of hardship to pay another bill. So uh, to pay interest on it and, uh, you know, for an unnecessary trench that I did not have to do. I don't know where it, the follow-through got lost in the city. I could tell you the names of the people, but I don't want to do that because I don't believe in embarrassing people in a public forum. You have to. It's in my paperwork. And uh, my pictures are in my paperwork. And um, my sister is helping me because <laughs> I don't, I'm not good at this stuff. <laughs> You're so, doing just uh, fine. You're doing just fine. Okay. So, um, you know, I just, uh, a lot of money, and I, you know, I just feel like the fault was not mine. I was told several times, under the rocks, under the rocks, under the rocks. So, um, I, I really thank you for your time to let me kind of concise my big, long thing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I would like to be reimbursed, obviously. Um, and I would like to know the procedure after this, just for fun. Ms. Rowe, thank you very much. Uh, we will be discussing this matter in closed session in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, and then the city attorney will be in contact with you regarding uh, any action we may take on this matter. Okay. And thank minutes. you so much for being here. It's, can my sister come up now? Oh, I've lived in my house for uh, 45 years. Okay. And actually, to tell you the truth, I've never had a problem like this before. Okay. 
Thank you, Ms. Rowe. We Thank appreciate you. your presence here today. Anyone else who is with us today mm -hmm. wish to comment upon our closed session agenda? Ms. Bush, is there anyone online? There is not. No one online, no one else, last call. The city council will stand in recess. We are uh, going to, excuse me, me sir. Mr. Yes. Mayor, um, I, I sent an email to the council Given earlier this morning. Um, I would like to request that we add a subsequent need item. Okay, you may um, make a statement about it, please. Thank you. Just going back to Ms. Rowe's comments, um, I, I would expect she would be in contact with the risk manager. Risk manager, excuse me. That's right. Yeah. Uh, his name is Ross Brandon. Item. Yeah, uh, the risk manager, his name is Ross Brandon, and you can expect to hear from him after the council uh, meets in closed session. Um, I'm requesting that the council add an existing litigation item to the closed session as an item of subsequent need. The case is entitled Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine uh, versus the United States Food and Drug Administration. It's pending in the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit on appeal from a district court decision uh, in uh, Texas. The FDA uh, is appealing a decision that uh, made by a district court judge that outlawed the use of um, mifeprestone, which is commonly used for um, abortion and um, miscarriage-related procedures. Um, the need for the action is that it came to my attention yesterday after the agenda was posted, uh, and the, the um, amicus brief that's being filed is going to be filed at 3 p.m. today. So it's necessary to add this as subsequent need. Added, I so move to add that item. M motion by Council Member Watkins, second by <laughs> Council Member Thanks. Golder. Is there a debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion <laughs> passes you, and so ordered and, and is added to our closed session agenda. We now stand in recess to close session. Recording stopped. So is the procedure we just wait for? Are required to be considered, and that's not the case in care court. And then in care court, there's a role cut out for... Um, for a supporter, and um, and Ms. Rogers will talk a little bit about what that role is. So in terms of what a credible petition is gonna be, we know that the <laughs> criteria are you have to be 18 years of age or older, uh, you have to have schizophrenia spectrum disorder or another psychotic disorder, and that this is gonna have to be documented through an affidavit of a licensed behavioral healthcare clinician um, or evidence that the respondent was detained for a minimum of two intensive treatments under code 5250, and one, one of those most recently in the past 60 days. Um, and so only if a petition is, is credible would a care court process begin. Uh, there are two other sort of key criteria that clients have to meet. So one of the following, that either they would be unlikely to survive and deteriorating, or that they would likely become government dependents as outlined in Welfare and Institution Code 5150. Uh, next slide. Um, in terms of the implementation schedule, uh, Nicole mentioned that there's a phase statewide implementation. Uh, seven counties will be starting and are currently ramping up their care court operations to uh, begin in October of this year. Uh, Los Angeles County will also join those uh, seven counties in December of this year. And then in December of 2024, uh, the remaining 50 counties will, will be expected to have an operating care court. Um, there are some procedures where, whereby counties may be able to extend for up to a year to December 2025, um, but those would most likely be only under certain emergency conditions. Um, the other thing that we're monitoring are lawsuits that may impact implementation of care court. Uh, currently, there's one case before the state Supreme Court um, where groups are arguing to strike down the entire act. Um, 
arguing that it needlessly burdens sort of fundamental rights to privacy and self-determination. And so as those progress either through the superior, or through the state Supreme Court, or gets kicked down to the lower courts, those are, those are cases that we'll be monitoring. Um, to talk a little bit more about what the process might look like, I'm gonna turn it over to our public defender, Heather Rogers. Ms. Rogers, good afternoon. Welcome to the council chambers. Good afternoon, Mayor. It's nice to see you, and it's nice to see the rest of you as well. I'm very happy to be here. So CARE Court, the process, will go to the next slide. I have to be really honest with you and tell you we're all guessing. Mm -hmm. This is a brand new court. We've never had anything like this in the state. We've never had anything like this in Santa Cruz County. So some of our cohorts who are Laura's Law jurisdictions actually already have assisted outpatient treatment courts, and they have a little bit more of a blueprint of what this might look like. So I will do my best today to give you my best guess based on what we do know about how this will look for our clients and constituents. So once that petition is filed, and it does have to meet these certain criteria, the court has to evaluate whether there's an initial showing that care may be appropriate. The petition has to have with it either an affidavit of a clinician, which lays out the criteria and the reasons why someone needs care, or evidence that someone has been detained under um, Welfare and Institution Codes 5250 for 14 days of intensive treatment at least twice. And one of those incidents has to have occurred in the last 60 days. And so the goal here is to get people into care court who are in crisis, right? If folks are stable, we don't need another process to subject them to. This is for those people who aren't stable. The petition can be filed by community members. They have to meet certain criteria. They have to have a relationship to the client. So for example, somebody who lives with a person can file a petition. A roommate, a family member can file a petition. A clinician or a provider can file a petition or a first responder can file a petition, including a law enforcement officer. The petition, again, has to have all of that supporting documentation. It goes to the court. The court assesses whether there's an initial showing. If there is an initial showing, the court reaches out to county behavioral health and asks the county to do an evaluation, a clinical evaluation. That evaluation gets filed with the court. And at that point, the care court team comes together at that initial hearing. The public defender gets appointed to represent the client. The client can choose a care supporter, somebody from their network who they want to have there. It can be anybody. Representatives from County Behavioral Health join that team. And in addition, the participant can invite family members or friends there. It's a confidential proceeding, so it's not like this where anyone can walk in. It's dealing with someone's mental health, intimate facets of their life that we don't want open to the public, but the participant themselves can choose who's there. Once everyone is assembled and the um, participant has counsel, that's when we start working out a care plan. So behavioral health will chime in on what that should look at. My team will chime in with the input of our client. The client will chime in, the supporters will chime in, and a care agreement or a care plan will be hashed out that everyone can look at and say, this makes sense to us. The plans are expected to last for about 12 months, for about a year. During that time, there will be periodic reviews every 60 days to see how the participant is doing, and my team will be a part of those reviews to make sure that at every step of the way, the person who's receiving care understands their rights and responsibilities. After a year, the team gets back together to see how the person is doing. Care can be extended for an additional 12 months for a total of two years if everyone agrees to do that. Care is voluntary. This is not a situation where there is a penal consequence for not participating in care court. You can't be imprisoned or jailed or fined for not participating in care court. And so participant buy-in will be a critical piece of this process. At the end of the day, what we're hoping is that people get through care court, they get some skills, they get their medication stabilized, they have a supportive network, and at that point, County Behavioral Health will continue to work with that person to provide supportive services, housing support, whatever they need to be successful and not end up there again. Next slide, please. 
the rights that our clients have in care court are very similar to the rights they have in criminal court. They have the right to a notice of all care hearings. They have the right to be present at all care hearings. They have the right to counsel. They have the right to a public defender. They have a right to a supporter. They can have friends and family present at their discretion. They have the right to present evidence, the right to cross-examine and confront witnesses, the right to an appeal, and the right for the entire proceeding, including the care record, to be completely confidential. And with that, I'll pass the mic back to Ms. Coburn. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rogers. Ms. Coburn. So as you can imagine, um, and next slide, um, the housing is going to play a critical role with Care Corps. Um, one key piece of Care Corps and care plans is identifying housing so that clients are stabilized and they're connected to treatment. Um, this could look a variety of different ways. It may mean that we're going to need um, bridge housing, clinically uh, supported housing, licensed settings for both adults and seniors. Um, this could mean permanent supportive housing, and in some cases, it would continue to look like housing with family or friends, depending on if they have people in their lives who can provide that sort of housing. So it's going to take on a variety of different um, looks in terms of providing this as part of the, the care plans. Um, the state has been taking this seriously, um, and since 2021, as you probably are aware, they've been working on investing more and more funds out of the state budget into housing that provides a treatment element. Um, in the current year budget, the state uh, has set aside $1.5 billion for behavioral health bridge housing that specifically prioritizes care participants and staff within our behavioral health department as well as our housing for health division are actively looking at the application for this, which is due later this month, and trying to figure out. Um, they do intend to apply. It's just a matter of what the application looks like. Um, in 2024, I, you may have heard the governor is looking at a general obligation bond in the range of 3 to $5 billion that would specifically provide housing with a behavioral health component in residential settings. Um, this may take on different forms, but for all of these different um, options that are becoming available to us, um, this is an area where I think cities are gonna have a role in helping to site and build housing that would help support not only care participants, but others within our community that need these services. Next slide. So I just wanted, you've already heard some of the challenges that are starting to emerge um, as we've been having this presentation. But one um, that's um, critical to keep in mind is that Care Corps is very narrowly focused. Um, and not everyone realizes that. It's, very, it's focused on people with a schizophrenic spectrum or other psychotic disorders who meet these specific criteria. So uh, we just wanted to call that out as something to keep in mind because it really narrows the population we're talking about. The governor's administration estimates that eligible clients could range between 7,000 and 12,000. When you look at the county population as a percentage of the state population, this could mean um, only 50 to 90 clients within our county might be eligible based on this criteria. And then as another uh, metric, we also looked at the governor's estimate in comparison to the county's homeless per population as a percent of the state homeless population. And that is a slightly higher number. That could mean between 100 and 170 clients. But when you think about that in comparison to the number of homeless that we've identified through our counts, you know, that's still a small percentage of that 2,500 to 3,000 number. So, um, it's, it's, a, it's a much smaller number than, than those might realize. Another challenge, as we've been mentioning, is just the petition process. You know, this is going to be um, a barrier to entry um, in terms of getting into care court because it, it's those specific people as identified in the legislation that um, could petition 
for someone to get into court, and it has to be supported by an affidavit of um, a behavioral health clinician, um, specifically in most cases. Um, and then there are just administration challenges. Um, I mentioned the difficult to project numbers. That is impacting our planning as a county in terms of the numbers of county staff we're gonna need to devote to care court. Um, we have the public defender who's gonna be involved. We have our behavioral health department, which is a huge component of this. County council is also um, gonna play a key role in terms of representing the county, um, and there are others as well. So um, this is impacting us in terms of thinking through how we're gonna implement care court. Um, we also can't force clients to show up. You heard Heather say that this is a voluntary process. Um, and so there are some logistical things with getting clients engaged and having them appear um, through the petition process. And then the court process and timelines are still be being developed, so um, those could have an impact just on implementation. And you know, this is going to shift as we learn from those pilot counties um, regarding their implementation, and we're really looking towards them to see how the rollout goes. Next slide. Um, so just to highlight our care court implementation team, we have numerous county departments involved in this. You can see them all listed here. Um, we also have our county partners, both within the cities of Santa Cruz and Watsonville, um, as well as our private bar um, and private attorneys in Watsonville Law Center and um, the Superior Court, which will play a role. Uh, we've been meeting quarterly so far. We just had a meeting in March, and we're planning to move to more frequent meetings in the fall as we start to get more information from the pilot counties and really ratchet up our um, implementation plans. Um, this, you know, we're, we've chosen to include both internal county departments and our city partners because we're all in this together in terms of figuring out um, the protocols behind Care Court. And we're really committed to sharing ownership of what happens here and doing this in a trauma-informed, culturally responsive way. Um, and so with that, um, we're happy to answer your questions or try to, um, depending on <laughs> what those are. Uh, we're still, as we've all kind of noted, still figuring this out. First of all, thank you all three of you very, very much. We appreciate that. I know uh, we appreciate the notion that we are very, very early in this, and uh, which is one of the reasons we were so pleased when you accepted our offer to come over here and talk about it because we do believe that in so many ways we're clearly implicated in this in terms of, of an overall program. Let me, before I ask my questions, let me go to Ms. Bruner. You have questions, have your microphone up. Um, thank you so much and thank you for the slides and the information. I think, you know, as we, um, have constituents and and members of the public and our community members and um, our people who work in the city live in the city and we are um, tasked with a lot of policy decisions and we've been really working on housing decisions and always along the way care courts comes up in those discussions um, and um, it's been very helpful um, to read through a lot of the data and to understand even more. I didn't realize how narrowly focused of a demographic it would serve. And um, so I, I feel like I've learned a lot to date, even though we still don't know a lot. And I can hear and understand what you're working with, all the unknowns. It makes it challenging to plan how this will all lay out. Um, I'm hopeful for um, you know some of the, the the programs and fundings and solutions that are coming out to try and support um, uh, members of our community. And even though it is a narrow focus, hey, those are 50 to 90 more people that could potentially be supported in that decision-making process. So I think that's a win. Um, and um, I think as 
I, I would really um, love to stay up to date, let's say, you know, over the course of the year as things unfold. Um, I think it's really helpful for us in um, understanding how we can support. I heard something about siting and, and um, housing. I know that we have permanent supportive housings, a couple of um, developments getting built um, that, you know, having that partnership. So my questions are, I saw on your partner list, City of Capitola and Scotts Valley were not listed, and I'm just curious about that. They are definitely a partner of ours. I think it has more to do with a bandwidth issue. And, you know, we started off with the larger cities in terms of having uh, more time and ability to engage with us early on. But we, of course, um, are happy to collaborate with them and we'll include them as well going forward. Okay, that was my guess. I just wanted to make sure. And um, also, um, in terms of um, this process, um, you said it was new, nothing has been like this, and I know there are other demographics that could really benefit from this type of process of support and community-based um, self-determination. Um, you know, we've had the discussions about conservatorship and incarceration and um, really getting to the core health and human services support of whatever the needs are. So are there other, and you don't have to answer if you don't know, but um, demographics that, um, is there count, work on the county side to service other demographics for um, in this process? Yeah, um, my understanding is um, obviously there's other demographics out there that need similar services yes. in terms of behavioral health and substance use yes. disorder needs. Um, and, you know, we're actively working on ways to expand those services in coordination with, you know, housing and what that looks like to stabilize folks. Um, I believe the governor's administration is also looking at ways that they can further expand and invest in additional services. So um, I think that's going to be ongoing, and um, you know we're happy to come back and report on on anything else that um, ends up getting implemented in the future. Okay, that's yeah. Just add a little bit on that. So the care population that we project to be serving is very similar to the population that we serve now as public defenders. There's a lot of overlap in our community between people who are suffering from mental health disorders and substance use disorders and people who get system involved. And so at the public defender's office, we are definitely looking at other demographics, right? We are heavily pursuing mental health diversion options, restorative justice in partnership with our DA's office. We are um, you know, implementing a community-based whole person defense model that includes social workers and advocates. And so we're hoping that with all of these different solutions that really go upstream to try to address root causes, that we'll be able to wrap around more of the folks who really need our help. I think for me, the, um, the gist of care court that I think we all need to be really cognizant of is our jails are not the place to be treating folks who are suffering from mental illness and the criminal legal system is not the place for that either. So I know that our county partners, our city partners, really everyone in this community understands that and is committed to the long-term solutions. Care Court is just a piece of that, but we are always open to ideas at Public Defender for doing better in that regard. Thank you. That's really hopeful to hear, and um, I hope to stay connected in, in, in hearing more about that. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Watkins. Well, th yeah, thank you for the presentation, and I know it's early on, so but it was helpful to hear. Um, Councilmember Bruner got at my questions around, I think, just like the, the collaborative court model and that continuum of services and interventions and touch points along the way. Um, I, obviously, there's concern with a voluntary program like this. I think if somebody is um, d demonstrating psychotic and schizophrenic behaviors to have a voluntary participation seems like an even smaller population, even if they're eligible. I don't know if you have thoughts on that, but 
if you're already at that level, I would automatically assume that somebody might not necessarily volunteer to do this. I don't know if you guys want to speak to that more. Thanks, Heather. It's interesting. I've thought a lot about this. People also don't really volunteer for restorative justice or mental health diversion. This is another tool in our toolkit for diverting people out of the system. And so by way of example, we may have folks who are arrested. The DA takes a look at the um, initial report and says, what we have here is someone who needs treatment, not incarceration. Mm -hmm. And they're now going to have an option to call me and say, I want you to reach out to this person where someone's filing a care court petition, whether it be you know, law enforcement or somebody who cares about them. We don't want them to be system involved, but the elements of the crime are met. Right? And so there are a lot of, like I said, there's so much overlap. And I feel there are a lot of ways that we can use this to divert cases that we really know need more intensive treatment. The other thing that happens at the end, if someone does not engage in voluntary treatment and is, is still doing poorly, is we have our conservatorship options still available. And so care court gives a person who's on the cusp of that a chance for a little more support and self-determination, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Totally. Does yeah, that help? I, yeah, it does. I appreciate you framing it that way because you know, having been part of restorative justice programming, there is also the other option, right? The other option being, oh, you go into probation or you have a traditional type of outcome. But if you don't have that other option, I think that, that would be the concern of just a pure voluntary mm -hmm. um, program. So I really appreciate that explanation. Um, I guess my other last question uh, at this time is, in terms of like the co-occurring um, members of our community who are displaying behaviors that are schizophrenic-like or psychotic, but also are using substance abuse or substance misuse, where do they fit into that spectrum? I'm assuming it's probably a similar response as you've already provided in terms of the options, but I see that as something that's sort of this overlap and difficulty of, is it a substance use um, psychosis that's kind of generated from that space, or is it actually truly a mental health um, challenge? And it's been a challenge in identifying for service or any insights, yeah. I mean, we confront this every day in the criminal courts, right? When we're trying to understand whether someone qualifies for mental health diversion, is a good candidate, whether this is someone who needs medication or somebody who just needs to detox. And I don't think anything about the care court model is going to make that process easier. At some point, a clinician is going to have to make the call, right? That this is a schizophrenia spectrum or psychotic disorder rather than a symptom of, um, of drug use. Um, these are tough calls. Okay, yeah, okay, that makes sense. All right, I think those are all my questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Great, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much for the presentation and for being here and the work that you do in the community. Um, I, I have a number of questions I'm gonna try to synthesize and, and okay. not ask all of them so that my colleagues can have a chance. Um, I'm really glad, Heather, that you brought up that we have existing programs and resources that we can leverage. The CAFE's program comes to mind as a way to kind of braid what we have in place and then use Care Court as an augmentation. Um, and, and we have a lot of um, demand at the county and at the city. So I'm just wondering how the county is managing prioritizing the planning of preparing for care court and then when it gets to implementation, implementation. It's maybe a hard question to answer, but given all of our demands, how are we prioritizing this? Yeah, we've um, just started, decided to start early. So we've already had a couple meetings of our implementation team and um, initially we thought, you know, quarterly would be enough um, to kind of start this work out. Like I mentioned, we're planning to meet more frequently in the fall. Um, we're really waiting to get more information from the pilot counties and learn more about the lawsuit and how that proceeds, mm -hmm. which might guide some of our implementation. So um, we've taken this very seriously and obviously we wanna be successful and don't want to incur any penalties from not implementing or having to ask for a delay from the state. So. 
Um, I think we'll be well positioned to implement by December 1st of 2024. Um, and, you know, the next year, a year from this fall, you know, we'll really ratchet up the time we spend with it. Okay, you hit a bunch of other questions I had, so I won't ask those. Okay. Um, you, you guys talked about siting and how important siting is, and that's where um, cities and other partners can come and support. What is the county doing now to get an early start on siting, and are we using the county's housing element process to identify potential sites for um, these residential services? Yeah, the, um, like I mentioned, staff are already looking at sites that the county might have that would be potentially could be used as part of a, a behavioral health bridge housing project. Mm -hmm. um, the housing element is a really good example of something that is starting to happen that is going to be um, critical um, to identifying places where we might site additional um, housing specifically related to um, this uh, clientele and others. So um, the, we, we have a public process we're going to go through that involves various um, individuals and community partners to help us identify those sites and um, as well as a series of um, outreach and meetings that will be held. So hopefully we can, through that process, we can come up with um, a plan for where we might put all of these facilities. Okay, great. I think just two more questions. Um, so the other piece of this that we have to prepare for is the staffing of it, making sure that we have the clinicians to do the assessments effectively and efficiently, and then the care supporters. Um, is there an opportunity with what's happening with CalAIM and uh, community health workers across the state and what we're doing at the county level to, to think about workforce development in that way? Or what are we doing around workforce development and, and that may be an opportunity? That could definitely be an opportunity. Um, CalAIM is also a big initiative that is currently in the planning process that we're working towards trying to implement. Um, and um, it, there very well may be an opportunity to expound the number of providers and people uh, working in our community to provide these types of services. And I know um, both Heather and Sven have been involved in the CalAIM implementation side of things too, so I don't know if either of you have anything else to add. But Okay, great. Last question. Um, so... We would love to be a supportive partner. Like you said, we're all in this together. Um, we benefit from a successful program. I heard very clearly that the governor is allocating some funds towards this. Um, what can we as a city do to show the great need? I think our need is greater than a lot of other cities that are like us. What can we do to help you show the need so that we can acquire those dollars? And maybe you can think about that and let us know. Yeah, we're happy to get back to you with any thoughts we have. Um, there is an application open right now, so we're going to be applying for those. And um, I'm sure that staff would reach out if we needed any letters of support to go along with our applications. But we can get back to you if there are additional um, ways. Obviously, advocacy at the state level for additional funds in all of these areas is critical. So you know, bills or funding tied to both housing and behavioral health services is always appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, you can go first. I have so many I can also block. So there we go. go. All right. All right. Again, thank you for your presentation. Is there a judge in these things? Is there a judge in this court? Is it one of our existing members of the bench? Do we get a new judge in the county? What, what is the arrangement with managing the judiciary's calendar on this? Uh, there's going to be an, a judge. Um, we don't get a new judge, and so we'll have to use the resources we have. But we are envisioning a whole new courtroom with a new process, a new defense team, with social workers, advocates, an investigator, a defender. It's a whole new thing. Um, the only person who won't be in that room is a prosecutor because it's not criminal. Mm -hmm. Zero. Aside from the potential capital outlay of a general obligation bond, is there a funding stream? I, I, in reading the bill, it didn't look like there was a, either a funding stream nor an appropriation in the bill. No, there's the $1.5 billion for behavioral health bridge housing in the current fiscal year. There is um, monies tied to implementation, but it's not enough. 
Um, it's not going to fund our public defender, our county council, our behavioral health department, and um, servicing these clients. So um, at this moment, it's pretty much an unfunded mandate, and we're anticipating that we're going to have to set aside general fund money to help support this effort, and we're making plans for that. But we'll continue to advocate at the state level to help support our departments in serving these clients. Let me ask this question. Uh, well, I, I want to go to this. Uh, you showed the partners on there and uh, the notion of uh, Scotts Valley and, and Capitola. They're very small jurisdictions, certainly. Uh, they're not immune to the issue of folks having these kinds of experiences in their life, whether they're unhoused or not. Uh, it is uh, less apparent in those communities, perhaps, uh, but it is not at zero. So how do you, I, I want to pursue this question of the four cities and the county so that our city or the county government is not being asked to do more than their fair share. So we have two other cities, and I'm wondering how either the county or some entity is going to catch them in the net as well. Yeah, I think, you know, we're going to continue to communicate with them and um, reiterate the importance of them being playing a role in, in the implementation process. Um, like I mentioned previously, we just started with the larger jurisdictions, but obviously this impacts everyone and there would be clients across the county potentially. Let's assume a fact not in evidence yet, which is that the governor and the legislature placed the bond measure on the ballot and then the voters approve it. And the wiring instructions in this bond measure are for what capital outlay purposes? Uh, the, as far as I've read so far, it's um, for housing, but with a treatment focus. Um, so they're really looking towards funding or meeting the, the gap in, I think it's 600 treatment beds that they've estimated that um, we need across the state of California. So it's really housing with a behavioral health treatment focus and it um, could take different forms. You know, it, it, it might look like a variety of different types of housing. Um, and hopefully if it were to pass, um, our county could you know, get a sizable amount of those funds um, to help fulfill our needs. When I had the great privilege of serving in the legislature, uh, any time a statewide number got thrown out, the way we looked at it, and at least in my office, was that Santa Cruz County would get 1% of, of, and I think the CAO's office has oftentimes used that sort of windage an elevation survey number. So say if they say it's $20 billion, we say what's 1% of that? That's what we're likely to get. Is is that essential? Because of the, the population of our county and, and the needs issues inside that, is that roughly what you're looking at? Yeah, we haven't even, um, you know, that's possible that it might be close to 1%, but we haven't even seen or received any sort of allocation of what that looks like for our county. Um, hopefully, we would have an opportunity through CSAC and um, those who advocate for us, you know, to help uh, figure out how we can maximize our allocation. Let's assume this also for sake of discussion that whether it passes or doesn't pass, whether there's a bond measure and it passes or doesn't pass. I mean, let's set that aside for just a second. So. We are, we are here in the city of Santa Cruz. We're trying to do our fair share and maybe a little bit more when it comes to issues around uh, folks with very serious challenges in their life and especially folks who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, absent a state bond or other capital outlay funding source from the state government, I suspect the county is not going to put a general obligation bond on the ballot to fund the capital outlay side of this. Would that be fair? 
Uh, we haven't made any decisions regarding um, whether or not to put a general obligation bond on the ballot. Um, we're currently trying to pursue any sorts of grants or other applications that are currently available. Um, and we would take a look at whether, you know, some sort of tax measure would make sense in the future. In the event that the state doesn't either place a bond measure on the ballot or the voters reject it, and in the case that the county does or doesn't put a bond measure on the ballot and it fails, is the local government then continuing to be obligated under this to provide somehow the capital outlay to meet the residential needs and other cap capital outlay needs? Or is there some, if, if the state won't do it, the county won't do it, the city won't do it, uh, on the capital outlay side, what what does this program then do? Yeah, I th think we'd have to take a look at what that means at that point and get back to you. I, I'm honestly, at, I'm not sure what entirely that would mean. Housing is a is a key component of a care plan. Sure seems so to if be. there is no housing, um, we'd have to figure out what that means. Ms. Rogers, any thoughts on that? Question of the hour, isn't it? We need we need housing, and um, for care, we're we're going to need housing, and that should definitely be the focus of all of our jurisdictions: is how we can bridge this gap, not only because of Care Court, but because it's the right thing to do for our community members. Sure, right, and I think that that, in a sense, because of the arena allocation and the way that it uh, does segment across income lines. Uh, that uh, we will be, whether it's the county or the city or the other th three cities in the county, uh, we will be submitting our housing elements of our general plan to the Department of Housing and Community Development for approval. Is there, as far as you know, is there any degree to which HCD is going to be looking at this in the context of approving housing elements? I haven't heard anything discussed specifically related to that component, um, but happy to take that you know, back with us, and if we do hear something, get back to you. Thank you, thank you. Council Member Golder. Okay, so I don't have my question list, so I have quite a few, but if you can't answer all of them. Uh, oh, thank you. I have quite a few questions still on my list, but if you can't answer all of them, maybe we could get, get a report back or something at some point. So I just was wondering, and if you don't know, uh, how many how many beds there are currently in the unincorporated areas of the county for bridge or for permanent supportive housing? We we would get, get back, back to, to you. Okay, on perfect. That one. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and then, since we all know early intervention is key, would minors, specifically teens, that are suffering, be eligible for this process? No, I, I think the criteria, it's 18 and older, so you'd have to be an adult, so it wouldn't be minors. Okay. Um, my next question is, at some point you mentioned unlikely to survive. Can you tell me more what that means, like in legal terms maybe? <laughs> I don't. I think that came up when Ms. Coburn was talking about the legal challenges mm -hmm. to, to care court. Is that the context? No, it was like somebody that was un unlikely to survive Amen. as a criteria. Somebody who's deteriorating to the point where they can no longer care for themselves. And so care court is really the, the bridge that you pass before you get to a conservatorship, right? Where somebody is having decisions made for them. And so I think, I mean, I'm thinking in terms of, for example, if someone's able to like feed themselves like by eating out of the trash, like, is that likely to survive? That's what, I, does that make sense? Is that, that likely is to survive? That is not a bar to care court. As long as they have the other criteria and so a schizophrenia spectrum or psychotic disorder. Okay. The <coughs> unlikely to survive element of the plan is simply we're trying to target those people who are right on the edge of a more serious and pervasive intervention. Huh. You know, people who are really teetering on either a conservatorship or doubling down on system involvement because their behaviors are becoming such that it's difficult for them to manage without an intervention. Okay. Um, and then you did say that it's there's other psych psychiatric disorders. Are 
substance use disorder or bipolar disorder on that list? Are there uh, what are other psychiatric disorders that are on the list aside from schizophrenia? Or is it just psychotic disorder? So schizophrenia spectrum or psychotic disorder is how the, the statute reads. It's very narrow. So I feel that the populations that you're talking about, we're going to have to look at our other tools in our toolkit to keep them out of the system and to get them supportive services. Okay. Um, and then I'm just wondering, and maybe Bernie knows, but this one, but you vaguely touched on this about, about like numbers, but in, do we have any idea of what terms... Um, I mean, there's some people you have regular contact with. What what percent of the homeless population out there? I mean, there's from police contacts or something like that. More specifically, no. Okay. And then my 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 last question: When you're on that partners page, I didn't catch it, but was was Dignity Pam for Kaiser on there? They were on there, all three of them. They weren't on there. No, those the uh, what was listed on that slide was just our internal county departments and then our city jurisdictions. But the health care providers, obviously, if we need to work with them, um, we would need to include them as well. Yeah, and I, I guess I just don't know how someone gets those big hospitals get the contracts in the county. But it seems like as a condition for them operating, I would hope that they would be willing partners in writing at least the. Um, temporary beds or something like that in some way or some sort of clinical support. Um, and then I guess that does conclude my questions. I, everybody else asked my other one. Thank you. Very good. Again, thank you so very much for being here. Let me give an opportunity for just a second. If you'd have a seat right there, let me just see if anybody wishes to comment on the presentation that's been made today. I know. I know we don't. We're okay. Good afternoon. Good enough. Good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to be here. Great to see you, Tony. Um, I wasn't expecting to be able to comment on this subject, but I took about two pages of notes, and so. I'm not quite sure where this group is getting all their information, but it seems like there's a great deal more of information available. Um, and I'll start with something that uh, the previous police chief, Andy Mills, wrote about two months ago. Um, they are kind of focusing on the homeless and talking about the individuals that they're having particular problems with, with in the future to pass legislation to isolate those individuals. And if that ever comes to pass, people who speak publicly, like myself, are also targeted. We're all targeted. But as far as, you know, shooting from the hip and all this information is new, I, I would like to disagree. Had I known about this subject, I would have brought a bunch of information with me that's in my truck. Um, there's been a psychological and physical and educational control going on for quite some time. I mean, I could go back to the recent past to information that uh, Brock Chisholm started to disseminate in 1946. And if you look at that information, it describes exactly what's going on now. Brock Chisholm was the first inspector general of the UN from 1948 to 1953. Now, in kind of changing the subject, I could go on. We could go with why the League of Nations was started and talk about Colonel House's work, or we could go back even further. I guess before I change the subject, I'll say that diets affected human beings where it's well documented for more than 150 years. Even 20 years ago, I was listening to information on how people who have been categorized with schizophrenic, that their situations could change by changing their diet. Now to move forward and bring it more into what's going on in this county, I had a friend that, for whatever reason, made some mistakes and got herself a 5150. You know, what happened with the Santa Cruz deputies, what happened with whatever that hospital was, and then she went somewhere else, and then she was at telecare, you know. Uh, I think it is really important for people to have the ability to have people to speak for them. And I know that I was there, and I had several recorded conversation with, with deputies that were very helpful. And I was actually in IntelliCare and got verbal stuff over the phone where I could have access to the records. 
And the people said no. And I called the sheriff's deputies to IntelliCare and uh, went down and filed another report. So what happened to my friend was very sad. And I think that um, I know that everybody here has the best of intentions. I know that the public defenders by the 2223 is a new area and they have a budget of about almost $9 million because I was there doing the budgetary hearings. So that's enough. I didn't think I was going to speak on this, but it's nice to see you all. Well, thank you very much. So let me conclude this part by... I do have someone online. Let's go ahead. Good afternoon. Three, two, one. Okay, not happening. Uh, let me again thank the county representatives and Ms. Rogers, the public defender, for being here. We really do appreciate being in this conversation early with you. It, uh, I think you can see by the nature of the questions from the members of the council that uh, this is right in one of those areas that is a, a very high priority set of challenges for our city. And uh, uh, my personal view is that the legislation is very much a step in the right direction. Uh, I read the legislative record on this and there was no small amount of controversy as this bill moved its way through the legislature. And I think it took uh, some, no small amount of courage for the legislature and the governor to enact this bill. And uh, I do believe that if we continue to work as partners in this, that, that we can avail ourselves of a new tool that I think when we walk around and we see folks with, uh, you know, that are having enormous challenges simply living in the moment on our streets, uh, that uh, some way for some of those folks to get some relief from the pain that is their lives is, is a very positive thing for us to do. So thank you, all three of you, so very, very much for being here. We're going to, uh, to move on here. Uh, we are on presiding officer announcements. I have none. Statements of disqualification. I would ask any council member who has a statement of disqualification on items on the agenda to do so at this time. Seeing and hearing none, we will proceed. Uh, are there additions and deletions uh, to our agenda, Ms. Bush? There are not, no. There are not. This is the opportunity for the city attorney to make any appropriate reports out of our closed session today. <coughs> Mr. Condotti, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley and members of the City Council. This uh, afternoon, the Council met at 1.30 p.m. in the Courtyard Conference Room uh, to discuss uh, the following items of uh, closed session business. Uh, first, before adjourning to closed session, the Council voted to add as an item of subsequent need a pending litigation matter in a case entitled Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine et al. versus U.S. Food and Drug Administration. <coughs> That's a case currently pending in the U.S. Federal Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Uh, and in that case, the council voted unanimously to authorize the city to join with other cities and counties throughout the country in an amicus brief filed this afternoon in support of the FDA's appeal of a Texas district court judge's decision that imposed a nationwide ban on the use of mifeprestone which is a medication that was approved by the FDA over 20 years ago as a safe and effective drug that's used by millions in the United States to terminate an unwanted or unsafe pregnancy or to treat miscarriages. Uh, the amicus brief highlights the shared interests and responsibility of local governments in protecting the health and safety of our residents, including access to essential health care, such as uh, reproductive health. Uh, items that we're on the agenda uh, that's posted our uh, conference with legal counsel concerning liability claims, the claims of Nancy P. Rowe, and the claim of Precision Grade Inc. Those are also listed 
uh, this afternoon on your consent calendar as agenda item eight. Uh, the council also met with a legal counsel to discuss one item of significant exposure to litigation. It also met with its real property negotiators to discuss uh, real property negotiations uh, concerning the property at 333 Locust Street, uh, which is adjacent to the City Hall complex on this block. Um, there was no reportable action on uh, any of those items. Mr. Condotti, thank you very much for that. We're on item five. This is uh, the opportunity to review the calendar. Is there anything you'd like to bring to our attention, Ms. Bush? On I have the calendar. No, no. Very good, thank you. We are on the consent agenda. For those of you unfamiliar with the process, <laughs> items six through 14, inclusive, will be voted on one vote. We will take all of those items together. Uh, let me first go to the council and see if members would like to either comment on or pull an item. Please. I have a comment on item 15, the second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 2023-05, amending the Santa Cruz Municipal Code Chapter 9.90, AB 48 one military equipment use and um pardon me council member that that is not part of the consent agenda that's uh item 15 is the first public hearing thank you i do not have a comment on the consent agenda certainly Absolutely. i'm, I'm Absolutely. jumping ahead in my agenda here and of course. it's under public hearings so i have a comment when we get to item 15. And, 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 you will be recognized, don't you worry about that. All right, uh, further comments on uh, agenda items six through 14. Anyone with us today wish to comment on items, any of those items six through 14? Good afternoon, sir. Yes, good afternoon. Um, you know, we're all doing the best we can. Life doesn't happen. Uh, to you, it happens for you. So I want to make comments on uh, the consent agenda item, meter replacement project. Okay. You know, what is there? 23,000 meters were replaced. When I kind of joke, and I'm kind of serious, I was taking care of some stuff out of friends, and lo and behold, this book appeared. It's called Just Say No to Big Brother Smart Meters. So this goes into a fair amount of detail. Uh, I th I'm not sure when this book was published, but I think it was about 2010. Um, I'm going to mention City Ordinance Against Smart Meters for Watsonville, where they passed an amendment where they stopped that for one year. But that was more than 10 years ago. Um, so the issue is here, and it kind of has to do with, did the public really ask for these things, and what are all these things actually doing? I mean, not that I would recommend anybody do this, but there's a water filtration system that anybody can use. It magnetically polarizes your water. If you put it too close to the water meter, it'll turn it off. I mean, this is for, this is eight magnets that are about 1,500 Gauss, and it's enough to do something pretty magical to your water, but it also turns off the, the water meter. So how much time do I got? Oh, I won't use all this time. Um, there's just a lot of information about what is being provided for people and the health and safety effects. I mean, obviously, this is a whole book about litigation, about the smart meters that was published in 2010, 2011. You don't think there's more information now? You know, you wonder why there's not more members of the public that are healthier than others enough to still um, participate and disagree with everybody in the room as politely as possible and provide information as such. So I suppose that's just my public comments. I um, want to stay on subject, so I'll stop for now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else with us wish to comment on the consent agenda? Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? We do not. No. We do not. A motion on the consent agenda would be in order. So Vice moved. Mayor moves the consent agenda. Seconded. Ms. Watkins makes a second under debate or discussion. Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? 
Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Tory Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We are on item number 15. This is the second reading and final adoption of Ordinance 2023-05, amending the code regarding AB 8, excuse me, 481 military equipment use. Let me see if we have any presentation on this. Is there public comment on this item? Seeing and hearing none, uh, are there council members? We're, we're now on, a, on the regular agenda. Yes, sir, on item 15. Yeah, I was somewhat expecting a presentation beforehand, but I can make public comments on item 15. Yes, you can. Okay, I spoke on, it was a different number two weeks ago, and the uh, current police chief spoke on it. It has to do with this little throw robot, which I think is very useful and could definitely help personnel to find out information about what's going on and for people's safety. Um, today, that was less than three pages. Two weeks ago, it was 44. And so I went into some detail about how one aspect of it on page six of that at the bottom about military weapons and the microwave weapons, how they affect people. And I chose to talk about how law enforcement is actually really being affected almost as much as teachers and children. Now, without law enforcement, we don't, we don't have laws. And without healthy children and teachers, what kind of a future do we have? Um, so, I mean, I had a book about smart meters. I mean, what, it's, it, there's just so many elephants in the room that aren't really being talked about that we're all being affected by whether we want to acknowledge them or not. I mean, it wasn't until the afternoon that someone said, look at the chemtrails. And I'm like, I've been busy. I hadn't looked up, but the sky is beautiful. But is that normal? No. Uh, but the weaponized streetlights, let's focus on that. I had the opportunity to actually put my hands on one of those phased array antennas. And it's pretty much exactly what professionals like Mark Steele have described. I don't know if I should pick that thing up and bring it to the sheriff's department. It seems like now that I've said that, that's exactly what I should do with that. Um, I'm just here because I know that everybody's doing the best they can and uh, there are things that just aren't really being discussed and to reduce something from 44 pages to a page and a half is still just those elephants in the room aren't being discussed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else was, wish to uh, provide us with comments or testimony on this item? Ms. Bush, anyone online? Okay, thank you. Any council members have questions or comments? Ms. Bruner. Um, I'll make a motion to um, move item 15, the second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 2023-25, amending the Santa Cruz Municipal Code Chapter 9.90, AB 481, military equipment use. Um, and I just wanted to add a little. Please, go ahead. Okay, well, still if part we, of your motion? Yeah. Yes, okay. before we get a second and then Certainly. we can have a discussion. Um, based on comments we received with the first reading last meeting and some input from community members, there was a little confusion that has been I'm, clear. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Let, let's do this. I'll, let's. I'll second. Thank you. Is that okay? What? Sorry. What I want, if you want to add, then let's add your language and then you can explain why you're adding your language. So there is a motion to approve the ordinance as submitted. There is a second. Would you like to add language? Just a, a direction for future agenda language to highlight the item that is being added or deleted from the military equipment list. I think that would help clarify okay. confusion. Okay. Okay, agreeable to second? Absolutely. Agreeable. Now, on your motion. 
That is my motion to um, accept the staff recommendation here to adopt ordinance number 2023 and that future language on this item because this is a new legislation and um, we're navigating through this. I think it would be really helpful to um, see any item, specific item added or deleted from the list to be highlighted in the description. Um, so it really stands out and is clear what, what's being done. So there's to avoid confusion and navigating through, I don't know, he said 44 pages, however many. Um, I just think it would be helpful going forward. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Further debate or discussion, Ms. Brown. Just a quick point, and I apologize for jumping the gun, but I had a sense of where that was going, and I absolutely agree. I raised it at the last meeting, and we did get a lot of communications about it, so I hope that that direction can be helpful as these uh, come before us in the future. Thank you. For the debate or discussion, anyone with us wish to comment on this item? Ms. Bush, no one online? No one. Thank you very much. Clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We're on item number 16. Uh, this is an ordinance amending Title 24 of the Municipal Code relating to various sections on parking. Uh, we have uh, staff present on this. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Council and Mayor Keeley. Um, my name is Sarah Noisy. I work in the Planning Department in the Advanced Planning Policy Planning Division. With me today is Joanna Edmonds, a transportation planner in our Public Works Department. And as soon as I can get um, organized here, we're going to have a presentation. Which is going to be the screen is ready to share. Um, Good afternoon, my name is Joanna Edmonds, um, Public Works Department, and today we're talking about um, updates to bike parking and um, auto parking code. So initially this began um, as an update for bike parking because of AB 2097, um, which went into effect in January. Uh, existing code has bike parking for commercial developments calculated as a percentage of auto parking. And that's significant because AB 2097 now exempts most new development within half a mile of a major transit stop from parking auto parking requirements. So therefore, with our existing code, if without any changes, we would not be able to require bike parking for commercial developments that fall into that zone, which obviously we still want to have bike parking, especially if there's not auto parking required. Um, so this also made us look at the rest of the city code to see what else needed to be updated to comply with AB 2097. So here we have, this is the map of major transit stops. Um, so you can see it's quite a large portion of the city. So um, of significance is the purple line is the coastal zone. So some of it falls within that area. And then the um, gold areas are existing transit service. And the red, which overlaps a little bit on, in the downtown, is planned. Um, so the gold part, the existing, uh, comes from current service that we have through Metro. So that's something that we monitor. And then the red is from some long-range planning documents. And we recognize 
transit service doesn't always stay the same, so this map will need to be adjusted. We would expect that existing wouldn't change more often than quarterly because that's when Metro updates their service schedules. And then the long range plans are generally on a five year cycle. So that's how frequently that would change. And those are all you know, potential. Um, it's also, so it's important to note the law applies to both of these zones and that uh, many of these places where they become major transit stops is because they have overlapping service. And so there's multiple routes in that area. And then um, they have, so it doesn't matter if it's one route or three routes, what, if there's a bus stopping there every 15 minutes, then that's part of this zone that would be affected or that is affected now by 2097. Um, next slide, we go into some of the details about the bike parking proposals. So. We, um, we looked at some things that we had in our um, ATP plan from 2017 for future updates of what we had already identified. Oh, sorry, uh, that's the active transportation plan. And um, then we also got feedback from community members and we looked um, at a lot of other jurisdictions that have similar progressive bike policy that, to our community, um, like San Luis Obispo, San Francisco, Davis, and Portland and Seattle to really help us um, make some of these updates. And uh, you'll see in your packet that the residential bike parking part is um, struck out, but that's just because we changed the formatting. We didn't actually change any of the metrics with residential bike parking. So it's still um, the same, and we've added some clarification for things that were a bit confusing sometimes for people when they were coming forward with planning um, applications. So for the commercial bike parking, we're now using square footage, so we're not dependent on that auto parking um, as a metric for the calculation. We've updated the categories, so that's the table that you see, would see in your packet um, to make it really clear what's required where. Um, we've strengthened our objective standards to current practice, um, made some clarifications for the parking district one, so that's the downtown parking district, and then Based on a lot of community feedback that we've had over the recent years, we've added some um, requirements for spaces for cargo bikes in developments that have larger um, quantity of bike parking. And then also for fix-it station, which is, in case you're wondering what that thing is on the screen, <laughs> that's a bike fix-it station that has tools and a pump so you can fix your bike up if necessary. And then we've added a little bit of clarification for how to substitute bike parking for required car parking. Okay, and then um, as Joanna mentioned in the background, um, sort of looking at updating our bike parking um, standards sort of alerted us to the reality that we had to make some changes to the way that we now regulate parking for cars in these areas of our city that are shown on that map. So the state law basically removes most parking requirements, so parking minimums. Um, for most development within a half mile of a major transit stop, which Joanna just defined. So lodging uses would still be required to provide parking, hotels, motels, bed and breakfast, things like that. Um, the state law does include some exceptions to the law, and our current proposed ordinance does um, propose to exceed the law in sort of in four ways. The first one being there are some exceptions that are written into um, the state law that would allow a jurisdiction to apply a minimum parking standard under certain limited circumstances. Um, in Santa Cruz, they would be extremely limited because none of our residential development would qualify for the exception. So there's like the state law, like general standard, shall not provide, require major, um, sorry, you shall not require minimum parking within a half mile. And then there's some exceptions to that rule, and then there's some exceptions to those exceptions. And so within that, basically all residential development in Santa Cruz would be excluded. We would not ever be able to require um, a minimum parking standard in these locations. Um, secondly, there is a small caveat about we're allowed to require parking for um, employees at event centers, but then event centers is not well-defined. The only place that we could think of that in Santa Cruz that might qualify 
might be the Warriors Arena, and we're going through a whole planning process around that. So if we feel the need to set some parking regulations around that use, I think the downtown, um, the expansion of the downtown plan is sort of the more appropriate way to do that rather than writing it into the zoning code. Um, thirdly, the state law does allow jurisdictions to continue to require um, parking for people with disabilities and parking for electric electric vehicles as would have otherwise been um, required had the state law not superseded. And we are recommending that we not do that, that we go ahead and just eliminate all parking if there's no parking um, required for anyone. That just means that there's no parking required. So do keep in mind that just because no parking is required doesn't mean that no parking will be built, right? What we see very often places where they've studied this is that parking is often still built. They build less parking. Um, and then whenever any parking is built, that built parking will have to comply with the California um, Disabilities Act and with the EV parking requirements. So um, where parking is provided, those off-street parking spaces will also be provided for people to be under both the EV and the ADA. The fourth place that our recommended ordinance kind of exceeds um, the state law is simply in the way that we're defining what's within half a mile of a major transit stop. So the state law says like three quarters of the site has to be within half a mile and we're just saying any part of the site is within half a mile. So it just kind of makes our mapping a little bit easier um, and makes the implementation a little more clear. So I do just also want to mention that um, the Climate Action Plan, which was approved by the previous council in September of last year, actually has um, action items that would eventually call for the elimination of off-street parking minimums and even move towards establishing maximums of, of off-street parking. So the state law is sort of consistent with some of those goals that we already have locally of moving more towards active modes of transportation or shared modes of transportation and reducing our dependence on um, specifically single occupancy vehicles. Um, and parking is one of the ways that we move in that direction. There are a couple of other sort of smaller updates that are wrapped up with this because they're in the same code section. So we're clarifying the allowance um, for, for parking lifts or, or parking stackers. So previously, we were kind of limiting the way that those could be used in the downtown. Um, so there was this extra process that do, projects had to go through in order to get them approved. So we've sort of just written some standards into the code to allow those. And now that would allow parking stackers to be used in all zones as long as they're within an enclosed space. If they want to be anywhere outside of an enclosed space, they would have to go through um, a more strict review with some performance standards. Um, and then obviously we're also adding the definitions of a major transit stop and of a parking lift and sort of reusing those terms in the code. So we took this item to the Planning Commission um, on March 16th and had um, a pretty robust discussion with them. It's the only item on the agenda and so they really took their time with it. Um, we really went through the details of the state law provisions. They asked a number of questions about, um, you know, how are we ensuring that we still are going to have access for people who have differences in mobility and need um, you know, parking spaces that are designed for folks with disabilities? So we talked through um, the provisions that we have of, for providing um, blue curb, so on-street parking for folks with disabilities. Um, and then also, just to highlight, um, having a handicap plates or any a disabled hang tag allows um, those automobiles to park at any meter in the city for free. So that's, um, we felt that that's providing like good access for those folks who have those um, mobility needs to still be able to participate in civic life. They also had some questions just about how we review bike parking and how we, you know, <laughs> look at these things in project applications that we clarified. And then ultimately that hearing ended with um, unanimous approval of recommending approval to the council. So um, should your council choose to approve this item today for publication, uh, the next steps would be there would be um, a second reading on the next available agenda on the 25th, and then that would give us 30 days should it be approved at that time. It would become effective outside the coastal zone on um, May 25th. So then we'll be submitting it to the Coastal Commission sometime later this year, and then um, our Friends over in Public Works uh, are going to have some more work to do on implementing those other parking uh, actions that are called for in the Climate Action Plan. Um, and that work is going to you know, kind of be taking place over the next several years. And so um, 
with that, our recommendation is here on the screen. I do just want to note that the recommendation that's printed in your packet fails to mention that the um, ordinance amendments are also part of the local coastal program implementation plan that was correctly noted in the noticing and in the agenda summary, but it, we missed putting it in the motion. So I just want to note that, um, that we're asking for a motion to introduce for publication an ordinance that would um, update bicycle parking requirements, incorporate recent changes to state law relating to automobile parking standards, update other existing standards relating to bike and vehicle parking, and add new de definitions while recognizing the environmental discrimination that's identified in the agenda report, which is um, essentially that uh, the bike parking and auto parking are, con are contained in the um, analysis that was conducted in the EIR for the general plan, and then furthermore that um, automobile parking is not an impact under state law. So um, with that, we are now available for any questions. Please have them. Thank you so much. Let me ask if there are questions. Ms. Kantar Johnson. Yes, yes. All right, thank you for the presentation and the report. A um, couple of questions. Uh, so I know you mentioned that um, the Metro's plan, the, long, the, 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 the plan for where, where bus stops are and how um, uh, Metro, I put, a, I put an acronym here and now I'm <laughs> remembering what I meant by the acronym, um, where the major transit stops, how they're determined, is determined by California code and determined by um, this process. So Metro is going through a strategic planning process and um, this may implicate changes to where the Metro transit stops are, the major transit stops are. Um, let's say that happens in five years or before five years, what is our process? Should this pass, what is our process in adjusting those buffer zones? So. I'll take a shot and I'll let you <laughs> go in. So um, these maps will need to be maintained. Like, so we have a couple of maps that are based on um, conditions that are like active on the ground. And so maintaining those is sort of part of some of the work that we do to you know, keep all of our GIS um, up mm -hmm. to speed. So that's, that actually falls in Claire and Joanna's um, arena to make sure at least annually that we're taking a look at these um, areas of existing service and ensuring that our GIS layer, which our planners use when they're reviewing development applications, matches what's happening. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so the timeline, it, should this pass today and it passes the second reading, what I, my understanding is that it would be, it could go into effect by the end of May, but it has to go to Coastal Commission. So are we in limbo and what happens if we have a development project that comes through after it's passed here, should it pass, and before it gets approved by Coastal? Well, so since this is a state law, um, we're obligated to apply that state law whether okay. or not our ordinance is in effect. So even within the Coastal Zone? Yeah, I mean, that would be my understanding. There's nothing in this particular law. Often when they have legislation that would interact with the Coastal Zone in some manner, they call out specifically, like, nothing in this legislation shall supersede the Coastal Act, and that's not mentioned in this legislation. So um, we're reading that as this does kind of apply also in the coastal zone. Got it, okay, I think last question, um, and we've emailed about this a little bit, but we, I know this is state law and we're augmenting it in these uh, four ways, um, but there are concerns about the implications on neighborhood, the neighborhood impacts when we aren't requiring parking. So if you could speak to what we're doing, mitigating actions that we're taking um, as a city and as a department to address neighborhood impacts. Sure, yeah, so there are a couple of things. So first of all, um, you know, the, the bike parking standards are themselves a mitigation. So ensuring that bike parking is available, safe and secure is one of the key pieces to ensuring that people um, actually feel encouraged and supported to use biking if that's an option for them. Um, along those lines also is our bike share program that's gonna be coming soon, <laughs> this summer. Um, so that's you know yet another component of creating mobility that doesn't rely exclusively on cars and hopefully moving some trips to those um, modes of transit. Um, the other thing is that as part of our um, objective design standards that we uh, adopted at the end of last year, there was a piece in there where we created a program that for residential development requires bus passes to be provided to residents of projects that have 20 units or more and are within the same buffer area. So 
for large residential, larger residential um, development in these areas, at least, um, Metro is going to be a very real option. They're going to have a transit pass in hand and a bus stop within half a mile. So, um, so those are some pieces of it. And then, you know, the city is also always working on other forms of mobility and supporting all the different ways that people need to get around and want to get around for all of the different ways that they have through the day. And you're, you're going to hear more about that with our downtown parking strategy later today. And I mean, all of this is part of just a big comprehensive program that's really looking at, um, you know, how are we meeting all of these needs? And um, we are in this transition moment. All of California really is in this kind of transition moment. And we are being um, guided by our state legislature in a much more urban direction than we have um, thought of ourselves over the last 40 years. And so these changes in um, transportation demand and in parking demand are part of that transition. And um, it's not all of it going to be easy. And all of it is moving us closer to having um, equitable housing options, climate justice for the globe, and then also just locally, you know, helping us meet those climate goals and reducing dependence. So um, there are lots of things that we're doing, and we'll con you know, be continuing to do it. <coughs> happen as we great actually just one more um, uh, so there are commercial areas and businesses that aren't within the buffer zones and so this this is maybe more of a comment than a question but um, those those areas that aren't within the buffer zone who are interested in in participating in this next wave of decreasing reliance on vehicles and moving to alternative modes of transportation and they're not now eligible for this um, minimum requirement exemption. Like, what are some steps we can think about and take in the future to address those areas that are outside the buffer zone? And this may be just for us to think about, and maybe you don't have a response right now, but you do. Good afternoon, Mary and Council. Claire Gologli, Transportation Planner for the city. Um, I actually think this is an area that you can show great leadership, uh, Council Member Colin Tara Johnson, in your role in the Metro Board. Um, in the work underway right now through the Comprehensive Operational Analysis, Metro will be bringing forward um, a proposal or a series of proposals on how to expand what this footprint looks like and how to expand the high quality transit network. Um, again, it's gonna be a series of growing pains and it's gonna be a change from what we know right now, but it does offer probably our greatest opportunity to expand what this footprint looks like and to expand our transit network. So I look forward to working with you on that. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Butler. Thank you, Mayor Keeley, and I um, appreciate the opportunity to also speak to the Council Member Calentari Johnson's uh, comments. And uh, I would just add that um, it's within the Council's purview to provide direction to staff to expand the area. We don't have to adhere to the buffer zones that are established by AB 2097. And in fact, our Climate Action Plan calls for us to, over the coming years, as Sarah mentioned, eliminate parking minimums and establish parking maximums. So it is within council's purview to provide direction. We cannot make that expansion here today because we haven't noticed that and um, it hasn't been commented on by the planning commission, but that is direction that you could provide and something that we could uh, pursue um, as we proceed. Council member Brown, did you have a believe you were up next. Yeah, I uh, thank you for the presentation and all of the work on this. I um, am thrilled to see the bicycle, the work on the bicycle uh, parking and the possibilities for um, that really being a resource for folks in these new uh, projects. And I thank you for reminding me that, that we do have a requirement about bus passes because I was going to bring that up. I didn't see it here and it, it is uh, covered. Um, but I did want to ask about the, just going back around to the staff decision to not uh, include the potential exceptions that the state is, um, has included in there in 2097, and because I am hard pressed to find a good reason to uh, get, voluntarily give away local authority in the particularly in the context of what's happening right now with uh, state law and um, unfunded mandates and, and the like so um, I guess I, I'm wondering if you could talk about this a little bit more and uh, you know I'm looking at the example you gave about uh, you know and and the 
the idea that we would most likely be, the, the most projects would meet the exceptions anyway, and so we don't, we wouldn't really have a case to apply them to. Um, and so, and I'm not, I guess I'm, I'm still not totally convinced of that, and there may be good reasons why in some cases um, this is something that we do want to hold on to, and one, and then two, in particular with the uh, exception around projects that have 20% uh, uh, low or very low or extremely low income units, uh, we are making an assumption here that that's the case for these projects, but as we know, that is not the case because of density bonuses, which are most likely going to be the case with a lot of these projects, or if not all of them. So we won't have 20% in those projects. Uh, we will have, if we're lucky, 15, um, 13 to 15 based on back of the envelope uh, sample calculations. So um, I, I guess I'd just like for, to hear you speak to that, both of those things. Sure. So, um, okay, so we're talking about, let me just make sure I, I got it all. So we're talking about, like, why would we give up any local control? Um, and then we're also talking about, um, does this exception apply or not? Okay, so um, I'm gonna answer the second one first, if that's okay. So state law has consistently been interpreted by um, courts to read text like this as applying to the base project. So um, for those who may not be aware, members of the public who may be listening, um, every density bonus project that is applied for in the city of Santa Cruz has to include a set of base plans. So those are plans that meet all of our zoning and general plan and area plan requirements and include no density bonus. They have to show that that's a fully conforming project and then we determine how many units are they have are able to fit on the site and then they can apply for a density bonus based on that number of units and you know we ensure that the projects are comparable, the units are of similar size. So. Um, because our inclusionary standard is currently at 20% low income required in any base project, lots of most projects are now using the density bonus because that at that 20% level they are entitled to make that request. So um, you're correct that once you add that 20% bonus or either a 35% or 50% bonus, then um, the net affordable units drops. Um, and when there have been other qualifiers such as this one elsewhere in state law, the courts have consistently interpreted that 20% as being 20% of the base. So basically, state law has consistently been interpreted by the courts as you know, density bonus units are bonus and they aren't counted in any of these other cases. So um, I understand that that's you know, kind of disappointing and a little bit not, um, you know, maybe doesn't meet what we'd like it to say and that's, um, you know, that's kind of the reality of how it's been. So we're looking at this and saying, you know, between the two caveats that say either it's um, a minimum of 20% that are low or very low income, or it contains less than 20 housing units, that's, pr that's all our residential say. So at least for residential, it's, it's pretty much everything. Um, so now to the, this question of like, you know, couldn't we still continue to require something um, for EV parking and for um, parking for the disabled. So we could, the state law does allow for that. And this is the consideration that we're making. So there are a couple of things. So first of all, um, is simply site planning, right? So if, if there is a development that could be developed with zero parking, and again, we really would only expect these to happen like very close to downtown, that something would truly be developed with no parking. Um, adding even ADA spaces or EV spaces changes the way that you have to plan for the site. So now you need a frontage, and that frontage can't just be sidewalk and retail space. There has to be a driveway and a garage that are directly accessible to the street. And then you have to, you would need to have like signage there, so it clearly, so people aren't trying to enter and trying to park there, to only to find that they're not driving an EV and they're not disabled, and then they can't park there, and so then they have to turn around and come out. So. In thinking about that, and then in thinking about the ways that um, the other uh, options there are for automobile, um, for EV car charging in all of our public lots and in you know anywhere that parking is built, and you know lots of parking will be built, they will still be needing to meet our standards for EV parking. 
and for um, parking for the disabled. And then also thinking about the ways that we can provide space on the street to meet those needs for folks with you know, mobility needs, genuine mobility needs. Um, we feel that we are addressing those needs to a great degree, and it's not really the benefit that we would get from like requiring this limited number of parking spaces, and then, you know, the whole change to the to the um, site plan that would have to come with that, including a driveway and backup space. Um, there wasn't really a lot of benefit that we were getting anymore, and so this is our recommendation: is that we just forego parking entirely. Any parking that is built will have to provide you know, 12% EV spaces and, you know, one per, per 50 for um, ADA and it kind of scales depending on how many parking spaces there are. So, so that's, you know, that's why this is our recommendation. I have uh, just a follow-up question and then one other that I remembered. Uh, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, I, again, I'm still just, because it w it's, if we include the possibility of that exception, it doesn't mean that we have to, we're going to be requiring that of a project. It would just, I, I'm trying to understand here, um, this is a. This, give us the option. It would give us the, uh, that's my understanding. Um, for, and there, I'm just thinking about, you know, some of the possibilities here. And, and I think about a, a site like, um, for example, the corner of Laurel and Pacific, where there really is almost no on-street parking and 205 units are going to be built. I recognize that there's a different set of parameters there because of when that project was permitted and, and being, is being built. But I'm just thinking about sites like that where um, it really could be uh, the city may have an interest in, in supporting or, or you know pushing a developer to um, include parking in those cases. So. Again, I, I'm just, is there a down, I mean, there's a downside to proceeding along that path, but I'm just wondering what the downside is to allowing that to be, that option, thank you, uh, in, in the ordinance itself. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess the only, the, I don't know that I would say that there's a, a downside to keeping an option, and I think there are some complications we would wanna think through. So we would want to make sure that we had standards that were objective, right? Because we know that that's important these days. Um, and then we would want to um, make sure that they were kind of equally applied, right? So we would need to be able to define a site like you're describing in an objective manner in order to be able to maintain that as an option. Um, so for example, when there's no street parking around parking the site, yeah, or very little. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think planning director. Mr. Butler. Thank you, and uh, thanks. Uh, I think, Sarah, you did a great job of explaining sort of the rationale that led us to where we're at. Um, I think I, I would add in part to address the, the question about the downside um, that you asked about, Councilmember Brown. Um, the, um, the state law, AB 2097, specifies that um, within 30 days, the public agency, within 30 days of the receipt of a completed application, uh, the public agency has to make written findings um, supported by a preponderance of the evidence on the record that um, not imposing or enforcing parking minimums um, would have a substantially negative impact. Um, and, um, it, it speaks about the, the different things that it would have a substantially negative impact on, um, like um, meeting our regional housing needs. Um, in, in that instance, for example, the provision of parking is actually going to frustrate the purposes of meeting our regional housing needs because, as Sarah mentioned, from a, a site planning perspective, if you're providing parking there, you're not providing housing. Um, and it goes on with, with various other um, uh, ways um, that you know we could potentially make those findings. I think what it boils down to is that um, with the um, exemptions, it's um, creating um, it, it's creating a process by which the city would have the burden of proof of establishing that there is a parking challenge, and I think the um, the primary um, 
crux of the issue is that when there is a parking challenge, developers will choose to provide parking because they're not going to be able to market their units if they don't have a, a client base, a, a tenant who isn't going to provide that, uh, who, who isn't going to uh, require that parking space. So um, ultimately, um, the market will respond, um, whether that is on an individual project basis or over the long term as um, parking uh, demand and supply changes. Um, Projects may build in additional parking or offer parking for um, people to, uh, to use if they're not residents um, or they're not visiting the businesses. You know, they're, they're building extra parking to lease. Um, so there will be a market response to this over the long term. And um, this opens up the flexibility to um, have parking um, if the developer sees that there's a need for it, or for them to say, no, in this particular instance, based on the, the um, tenants that we're targeting, based on the location and the proximity to transit or services, we don't want to provide that. And so um, having those exceptions, um, I think, one, creates some uncertainty, um, and two, it, it places additional demands on the city to provide that burden of proof. Um, when it could be something that the market um, addresses. Thank you. I'll, I'll reserve my comments on that for sure. uh, later. But I also have one last question, uh, if I could. Uh, that's related to, uh, in addition to the, the wonderful uh, work that you've done in looking at models around parking in, um, in new development, I'm wondering if any of those models or if you consider ha included or if you considered inclusion of or requiring uh, EV charging for bicycles. We have that in the case of park, car parking. We have a bicycle requirements, and um, it would be great for people in those high density projects to be able to charge their bicycles if that's where they're parking them. Yeah, happy, happy to take that one. So uh, most electric bikes that are on the market right now have a removable battery. Um, and most people just remove it and bring it into their unit or into their office space. They're charged with a regular standard plug. And so it's actually much easier to do that than to uh, wire a bike room or another facility for a ton of outlets. Yes. Good question, though. Council Member Golder. Um, I'm sorry. I'm so confused because I was under the impression we were cleaning up um, our local code to comply with state law, and I didn't realize until this um, presentation that we were actually going beyond that. And so some of what Council Member Brown was saying really um, rang true for me, and I just was really kind of um, apprehensive about going beyond what the state is requiring at this time in terms of giving up our local control. And I just think of if I... I'm a developer and I buy a house on the Upper West Side and tear it down and build a 10 bedroom house and then decide to have no parking and move in 20 students. How is that gonna impact the family that lives on either side? And is that some, am I like, like way out of left field here? Or is that something that literally could happen if we pass this today? So that's something that could happen today. Um, this, the law, the state law specifically says that we can't require parking for any development that's less than 20 units. So if you're talking about a single family home yeah. going from a three bedroom home to a 10 bedroom home, it's still one home. Mm -hmm. And um, this, the state law exemption would prevent us from requiring parking. Okay, and so then, in 2030, when we all move to electric vehicles, where does the state propose we charge them at night? I mean, well, <laughs> there's some, so there's a, there are a couple of challenges with everyone moving to electric vehicles. That, you know, the grid is a whole different issue that we're not going to solve here today. Right. Um, so, I mean, yes, this is, I mean, this is a concern. I think, so what we're seeing in development applications is that a lot of, the spaces that are coming in, they're required by our code to build out a certain number of them. It's 12% for residential development with a minimum of one space. 
And um, what we're seeing is that they're wiring so that they're like charger ready is like more than half of the spaces. That's like the, the one of the most recent um, applications we got in is doing that. So developers are starting to think ahead about that. And you know, again, we are in a transition period. We're transitioning in lots of different ways. And I think that's um, you know another way that like as multifamily housing gets built, I think as more people have electric vehicles, they may need to move away from having assigned parking because different people are going to need to have access to the chargers at different like Three times, in the morning, get up, know? move your car. Or, you know, you have access Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Someone else uses that space the other days of the week. So, yeah, I mean, I think public chargers are going to proliferate, right? I think we're probably going to see more requests for placing charging stations in our public lots. Um, and we may even start to see them um, curbside, you know, on, on some of our street parking as well. Um, and so in terms of people having, it just makes me so nervous. <laughs> I think somebody building a house with, and I know, I, and I, I understand that we're complying. I just feel really uncomfortable with going beyond and giving up any of our limited local control that we still have over land use. And I feel really, really strongly about that. And I, I, I don't know how to make that more of a question other than. Well, no, I, th I think I hear what you're saying. I, th I, I understand you're concerned about like the state gives us potentially this out, like why are we choosing not to use it, right? right? Yeah, no, I hear you. So it's a matter of how would we be able to use it? Would we be able to use it? Or would we write this into the code with a certain set of expectations and then never be able to use it? So this is kind of what we wrestled with as we were drafting the code. And um, the planning director mentioned you know, we have 30 days. Like, if we if we take one of these exemptions and write it into the code, um, we have 30 days to produce evidence that not requiring parking in this location would have one of three detrimental effects. It would negatively impact our ability to meet our arena. It would negatively impact residential or commercial parking in the area, or it would third. What's the third one? Um, it would negatively impact our ability to meet our any special housing needs for the elderly or persons with disabilities. So the idea that any requiring parking would negatively impact our ability to provide any kind of housing is sort of bizarre to me. I don't even not understand what that could mean. Um, so that leaves us with the other one, is that not requiring parking in this location would have a negative impact on existing parking supplies. Okay, so. What does that mean? What's a negative impact on an existing parking supply? Parking isn't an impact under CEQA. We can't evaluate it under CEQA. So that's an extremely subjective measure to even put in the state law. Second, we have 30 days to make that finding. So how, what kind of study are we going to produce in really two weeks of working time if you've got to like realize you need to do it and then publish it in some manner? Like How, how would we be able to that it's sort of mind-boggling honestly so in thinking all of that through and we're like what what are the chances we're going to be able to get something that would survive you know a legal challenge what are the chances we're going to be able to get something that would we would actually be able to use and then where would we want to even use it how would we get ready for it it just kind of became this enormous knot that um, we weren't certain was leading us to a lot of benefit I would reiterate one of the things that Sarah has mentioned, which is um, and the question she asked, which is where could we use it? We cannot use it. We certainly can't use it for projects under 20 residential units. We don't believe that we can use it on any residential projects based on our 20% inclusionary requirement. So that would leave us as um, establishing uh, this exception process to apply only to some commercial developments. And um, as, as we noted before, we have the climate action plan that is moving us to reduce or eliminate parking minimums and establish parking maximums. So this is really one step along the way on that spectrum. It is slightly going beyond state law, but really in, in that respect, with respect to the exceptions, we're talking about commercial components. And I'll say, you know, from from the perspective of existing businesses and existing um, uh, commercial conversions, um, particularly as um, retail has declined and restaurants have, um, have increased in 
um, popularity. The uh, ability to put in restaurants is um, limited by parking. They have a higher parking ratio than a retail uh, space would. And so this is also opening up the opportunities for those existing um, uh, vacant storefronts to convert to uh, restaurant uses. And um, you know, it's, it's one of the things that, that we do and will continue to wrestle with as a community. Um, of neighbors um, having concerns about the parking availability. There are options um, to address that. Um, for example, putting in um, permit parking requirements um, for um, neighborhood streets. Um, that's, that's one of the ways that um, those potential neighborhood concerns um, that that can be addressed should those uh, parking issues materialize. I appreciate how always persuasive you are, Mr. Butler. Um, but I, <laughs> I, I still am just wrestling with this. <laughs> and I, um, I do have some other comments, but I can wait. Council Member Watkins. Uh, yes, thank, thank you to my colleagues for bringing up the ADA, um, the ADA issue. I, too, was trying to understand that. And I was rereading that report and putting on my urban planning hat to try to best follow you guys. Um, but I... I I, I think I understand your logic, and I also understand the concern, particularly with the ADA population, specifically. Um, my question, I guess, following up on the questions that have already been asked is, what, uh, if, in your knowledge, have other jurisdictions done to address this? Mm -hmm. Do they have any, has any other jurisdiction not gone for this far? And if so, um, why? If, was it for similar reasons? Or if not, then... What, how did they untangle the knot as you describe it? Um, yeah, so this is as this is um, you know relatively new state law it just took effect this year, and so I um, haven't found other examples of other jurisdictions that have adopted ordinances um, along these lines. They they may be doing that. I haven't been, haven't been able to find them. There are a number of examples of cities that have eliminated parking minimums, and um, we have you know and they kind of. There might be a, a bit of a range of the way that they do it. They, some places do it only within certain neighborhoods. Some places have done it citywide. Other places have done it for residential citywide, but then commercial in a more limited way. Um, and you know, we do have some results of that. You know, the first city in the nation to do that was Buffalo, New York, and so, and there was a study done on like sort of what was the performance, what was the result of making that change, and um, they found that. Parking was still being built. It was they were building about half as much as had previously been required. Um, but so as soon as you're building one parking space, that first parking space is an ADA space, and then in Santa Cruz, that second space is an EV space. So you know, any parking that is built is going to provide those resources for the, the folks that are eligible. Um, and I think, and a lot of the places where they have pursued a zero parking Can standard. I pause you really oh, yeah, quick, yeah, just because ahead. I, just on that point, so even if the parking is built, but it's not necessarily near the location to the proximity that it needs to be for somebody with ADA needs? It would have to meet all those ADA standards. Okay, okay, yeah. please, okay. It's a, it's a complete law. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so the, res the evidence that we have from places that have gone ahead and like gone to zero parking is that, um, they are seeing this as sort of a stimulus, but particularly for commercial uses, that um, that parking standard has really been challenging for commercial uses to go in. A lot of residential uses are kind of continuing to just build parking. I mean, we saw that um, at 831 Water. They weren't required to build any parking, and they're building, like, one space per unit. So um, I, I would expect Santa Cruz to see similar results. Um, and you know their their results have been positive ultimately in places that have gone in this direction. Mr. Butler, thank you, Mayor Keeley. I'd highlight the point that Sarah made a little bit more about um, the implications for commercial. One of the things that we wrestle with oftentimes in our current planning is encouraging commercial, which is really critical for the health of our community both for employment opportunities and for options to walk and bike to goods and services that are needed. And with this, um, with the objective standards, for example, we saw quantitative evidence that our parking standards are hindering 
the ability to provide commercial and residential. And so these mixed use projects will be facilitated by providing lower parking ratios. Again, not that they won't provide any parking, but that they'll pick the right size parking and they'll look at how they can manage that parking between the commercial and residential component. So I appreciate Sarah raising that commercial part because that is really a key component, particularly given the high ratios of um, the parking requirements that we currently have for commercial that were also identified as part of our objective standards process when we did our test fit analyses. Sure, no, I appreciate you bringing that up. Just the uh, last question is more nuanced than that. I, you mentioned that the only kind of commercial recreation space you would think of is the, um, the Warriors Arena, but I was wondering wh where the Civic falls into your definition. <laughs> Yeah, so an event center. I mean, or potentially, yeah, potentially the Civic we could call an event center. It's not defined in the in the law at all. So, um, I would think of that as. A yeah, so you're right. Yes, the Civic is potentially an event center, um, and they already have their own parking, right? So in, in terms of like a new use that hasn't been built, where we would be requiring parking, right? This is you know kind of the only thing that's sort of on the horizon. Oh, Sorry. I see. I, I see apologize. I missed Okay, it. gotcha. No, I understand. To be built and yeah. therefore being requiring parking. I see. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you. I, I think I've gotten through all members who, who have asked questions. And thank you very much. If I might take a moment on this. Um, I'm intrigued by your last statement. The Civic's parking is where? The Civic they Auditorium have metered parking. parking. They have metered parking right next to the Civic. What I thought you meant. <laughs> I was unfamiliar with parking for the Civic. Um, let me see if I understand what the state's trying to do here. So the state believes that by reducing or eliminating the ability of local governments to mandate parking, that's then connected in a policy way to the desire to reduce vehicle miles traveled or whatever it might be by internal combustion engines. Is that right? It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an emission reduction strategy. Is that right? That would be a logical conclusion. Okay. <laughs> so if where Take we're one. going with this, so if from a policy perspective where we're going with this is that we are going to go to zero emission vehicles what is the objection to parking with zero emission vehicles? So it sounds like you're asking two questions. So you're first trying to understand, um, you know, what are so what are the differences between parking a zero emission vehicle versus parking um, an internal, internal combustion, combustion engine, engine vehicle, like meeting climate goals? Um, and then it sounds like there's also kind of a second question in there about like, um, is that really the goal? is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I think there's probably, um, these are, there are overlapping goals here. And again, this is conjecture because this is a state legislation and I wasn't there who made the law. <laughs> so, and this is my guess on that. Um, there's a relationship between transportation and land use. And as our um, state legislators are pushing us to change land use, they also need us to change transportation to make all of these things work together because it's one unified system. When we have options for transportation, then we can have more people in a smaller area and they can all get to their needs and meet all of their land use needs. When all of those people need to park cars, we can't get them in as small of a space because those cars take up so much space. We need parking at the origin, we need parking at the destination, and we need parking at all of those other places where the people need to go anyway. So that uses up a lot of urban land. So the state has several goals here. They are trying to meet emissions targets and reducing single occupancy vehicles reduces emissions of all types because even zero emissions vehicles still rely on power, which is still generated not entirely through solar panels and wind, right? So every, every vehicle has some amount of carbon footprint. Secondly, as we're trying to build more and more housing and put it into places where are already highly resourced, I, they have good jobs, they have good schools. Um, we need to make room for all of these new housing units to fit in those locations. And so one of the ways that we can do that is by encouraging other modes of transportation that will allow families to go down from two cars to one car, from one car to zero cars, 
that will allow um, you know, new professionals starting out in the world to delay getting their first car. All of these things add up because even zero emission vehicles can cause gridlock and can cause the pickup trucks for landscaping to sit in gridlock. So as we reduce parking for all vehicles, we are gonna be reducing greenhouse gas emissions, whether or not that's tied to the emissions of the vehicles themselves. When we are building, uh, when uh, assuming that the downtown expansion plan moves forward successfully and there's something between 1,600 and 1,800 new units in the downtown expansion area, if we assumed one vehicle uh, per unit, which is probably an underestimate, but if we do, are we saying that uh, 16 to 1,800 units with three to 4,000 people occupying those units downtown, the private sector is not going, we cannot require the, pri the private sector to build a parking space? The state law says that already. That's true now, today, as of January 1. Um, I also would kind of argue with the assumption that it's one vehicle per unit. I don't think that's accurate anymore. I think, you know, there's actually census data on this now, and um, and Metro, so I attended a very fascinating metro meeting by Metro Transit. And one of the things, one of the maps that they made was um, a map of concentration of households with zero cars. So this is a data point that you can pull from the US Census at this point. And um, those households are concentrated in a few neighborhoods, and two of them are in our downtown and in our Beach Flats area. So I think there actually are a lot of households that are currently operating on zero vehicles, and I think that number is likely to grow, particularly in the downtown. So um, it may not be very high. It might be, you know, I don't know. A reasonable estimate to me seems around, like, 15 to 20% of all households in the city might be a zero car household, but I think that number is likely to grow. And I think as we build housing that doesn't require a car and makes it inconvenient to own one, we will see that number grow. I mean, I think honestly, if we're talking about reducing VMT, which as I've mentioned is related to climate change and reducing travel time for everyone, um, the way that that happens is by making it less convenient park. That's just the truth of it. Either it's expensive or inconvenient. When parking is free and easy, everyone will drive. And we just simply are not in that state anymore in terms of land use in California. It's just not going to work. Thank you. I appreciate that. As to bike parking, can we require under this law, uh, under the new state statute, we can or cannot require bar bike parking? We can, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, my reading of the draft ordinance, I'd like you to take a look at page 16.2 in our agenda package and 16.3 if you could. We good? So stack it first. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking at the portion that begins with 658.63.2. Uh, when I looked at the ordinance itself, uh, I don't believe we have this state language in it. Is that correct? correct? Yes. It, it would occur to me that it might be useful, given this is where you, where we can deal with possible exemptions. Correct? That's what these sections are, the, the possible exemption section, yeah. correct? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it might be useful to, not by reference, but by actually placing it in the ordinance at the appropriate place. I think that would be a helpful thing so that folks don't have to go back and look at the statute because the statute is not written into our ordinance, if, I, if I've got it right. Is that correct? Uh, I'm not sure I understand what you're asking. You're asking that we incorporate these exceptions? That, it, well, l let me ask it a different way. Where are these exceptions incorporated in the draft ordinance? They are not. That's we are recommending that we do not do that. And why is that? So um, 
We are record for several reasons. So first of all, um, as we've mentioned, we don't believe that these exceptions um, would apply to very much at all. So based on the city's inclusionary requirement and our understanding of the way that um, state density bonus law has been interpreted by the courts, um, they would not apply. We would not be able to use any of these exceptions on any residential development, any residential component of residential of, of development. Um, so then we're looking at commercial development mm -hmm. only. Mm -hmm. And um, as we've discussed um, already, we've, we've been thinking about like how would we run a program that would do this? How would we make these findings? So how mm -hmm. would we find that there was a negative impact to existing commercial or residential parking? What is a negative impact to residential or commercial parking? Because it's not an impact under CEQA, so we'd be looking at some other metric. How are we going to define that metric, and then how are we going to make that finding in 30 days? So that's what the state law would require. Yeah, I heard, I, and I appreciate that. I heard that uh, when you made that point earlier, and I thought it was a very good point. Um, I'm not persuaded, though, that the point's good enough not to include this, because it is the one place, whether it's broadly applied, narrowly applied, it's six parcels, it's 5,000 parcels, it's the one place there's a the, the state law gives us a pressure release valve if we make the appropriate findings. Whether the state law has given you enough time to make findings or not is not my issue. My issue is that this is the pressure release valve that we may choose to use from time to time. It's permitted under the state law, and I think it's my view anyway that we should include that as the language in the state law put that, not by reference, but put that language in into our ordinance. That would be my preference. I understand the argument you made. I think it's a good argument. I think it does further point out how poorly drafted this is. Not all bills are drafted very well, and this, I think, is a bill that's not drafted very well. Uh, you know, I had my chance to draft bills, and of course, they were all perfect. Uh, <laughs> And the reign of terror at the time, but I do think that there's some benefit in, in doing that. Also, if we could, can you direct me to where we could put language in relative to bicycle parking? Where would we integrate that into the ordinance? To accomplish what with relative to bicycle parking? To make it very clear that if what we're doing here is we're in order to comply with state law, we can't require vehicle parking, it seems to me we are not prohibited from requiring bike parking. Am I right? Right. We do require bike parking, yeah. and we are continuing to require bike parking. Understand. And in, in, but with regard to this, do you believe that our existing code makes it unnecessary not to reference that, that we, we retain that yes. authority? I, that, yes. I think, I think we're covered. Okay, and where, where is that in the code? All right, Sarah, if I may jump in on that. So, um, again, Claire Gologly, transportation planner. The whole reason this item started was for that exact item, that we saw the flag that in not being able to provide parking, we also wouldn't be able to provide bike parking. So the, the basis of all of the ordinance that's in front of you, Sarah can hopefully find the correct section, uh, we added specific language that says... Um, even where no auto parking is required, these bike parking requirements still apply. And so that is for all land uses in all zones. That's specifically why we changed the calculation of required bike parking from percentage of required auto parking to square footage basis. So we're, we're clean so on that, that in, the, in the table on bike parking. That covers that. Yes. Yeah, so okay. if you look at page 1611 of the clean yeah. ordinance, yeah. Uh -huh. Got it. Got it. Can I ask a follow-up where you're still at? I am, but please, go ahead. Just a, a follow-up question on that, because I, I, I did notice this, and I, I just wanted to um, ask, though, because there are some, there's some language in here about the potential to, from I, my recollection is, I can't find it exactly where it is, um, to, for the, um, either the zoning administrator or planning director to waive this. Um, and so that means that it's not really a requirement. Um, I love this question. Thank so you. It would be um, great to just hear about yeah. Thanks. Yes. So the last time that we updated our bike parking standards, uh, the Planning Commission elected to make a recommendation that our residential bike parking requirements also added in 
one class two bike parking space per four units. Class two is a bike rack uh, rather than class one, which is an enclosed secure space. That is a very large proportion of bike parking. Off in some of the larger projects that we've seen recently, it is resulting in a quantity of bike parking that just doesn't pass a straight face test and isn't able to be sighted on site outside of the public right away in a way that makes any logical sense, even to me, a bike person. And so in those instances, we work with the project sponsor to right size the parking. Sometimes that's that we require additional class one parking, so enclosed secure parking for residents. Sometimes it's that we um, work with them to reduce or recite the amount of parking that is provided, a uh, bike parking that is provided, but it's, it's used very sparingly and only in projects where I could tell you it, it just does not make sense, the code requirements that we have. If, we, if the council wished to include 658.63.2 in the ordinance, where would we put that? Where would be your advice for putting that? You want to incorporate the language of the state law? Yes. So my recommendation would be that we do that under 2412-220. Um, 2412-220? Yeah. Thank you. Um, just on 16.7 of, of the clean version of your ordinance. Um, so, so, can I actually, can I consult with my colleague for a moment? Pardon me? May I consult with my colleague for a moment Please before do. I finish answering Please that do. question? Please do. Take your time. We're fine. Can I ask a procedural question? And it's a procedural question. If this is added, does that re-require any parking or extra parking? Oh, yeah. We don't, we don't so this would not be the first reading? No. Okay. Right. Just, I cut a portion of that. If you don't mind, I'd, la I'd like to ask the city attorney to weigh in. Uh, oh, yeah. If we had the exact language, it could be done so today. Otherwise, we would need to come back for a second first reading, if that's where it lands. Okay. okay. Procedurally, uh, so be it. Uh, sir. You know, that was essentially, I was going to mention that um, we can. Okay, so we would add, that. if we chose to, it would be in 2412.12.220. Is that correct? So that, that's, that would be my recommendation. Sure. That's what would make sense to me. Um, and okay. I, what I was just asking Lee about is um, uh, it might be easier for your council to give us direction to go back and draft that language um, rather than trying to read well, yeah. it into the record uh, uh, now. That, that's exactly okay. where it's going to go. <laughs> you got it. It's exactly there. I'm just looking to where it would be placed when we give you that direction. That, that, that'd be fine. Thank you. Um, my last comment uh, I will make uh, when there's a motion. Is there a motion? Does anyone with, it, with us wish to provide comment? Wow, I actually feel supported by more than seven, eight, more than six of the seven council members here took three pages of notes on this item. It's really just baffling. Um, it, it's hard not to be really rude about what's going through here. Well, don't be, <laughs> Dan. You know what? Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate your comment, and I appreciate you greatly, and I appreciate many of the things I've heard from staff today thank you but the dialogue i so disagree with by the people who are pushing this it was causing me to like really think some rather insulting thoughts and i took notes on that so it seems like there's going to be more information is going to be asked about this i know for myself as a contractor the parking downtown has gotten significantly worse. Now, I wasn't expecting to speak on this subject, um, so I didn't go through and read the particulars, but it, there's some stuff that I'm unclear of. It seems like these things go into effect 
when the residences are more than 20. But parking is already very difficult. And by the explanations of, let's say, the Civic Center, um, the downtown parking has become challenging. You know, upwards of like trying to find downtown parking in Palo Alto or San Francisco. So I'm glad that there's going to be some possible revisions. Um, although I could make some more particular comments, I appreciate your guidance, Mr. Keel. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bonnie, uh, excuse me, Ms. Bush, anyone with us online? There are, yes. All right. How many do we have? Currently four. Okay, let's take the first one. Hey, hello, Council. Uh, this is Ryan Meckel. I just wanted to call in in support of this. I think staff has done an incredible job here, and it's really great to see us pushing just a teeny bit beyond what we just absolutely have to do. Um, they made some great points with regard to climate, especially, and with regards to housing, I'll make a point as well. But first, the climate. Uh, this is something that's laid out in our climate action plan uh, to eliminate parking minimums and establish parking maximums. This is just that very first step working towards that to help mitigate our impact as a city on the climate. And I think it's a great one and an easy one to take. With regard to housing, anytime we are building a parking space or building a parking garage, we are not housing people, we are housing cars. And with housing cars comes a cost. The estimated cost to build a parking space, depending on where it is, be it on the surface level or in an underground garage, can range from tens of thousands of dollars in the low end to $100,000. And that is a cost that's passed on to whoever's living in the housing above the parking. Uh, like staff said, there are a lot of people in the city that don't own cars. I am one of them. I bike everywhere, and I am perfectly okay. <laughs> Maybe a little bit too passionate about bikes, but otherwise perfectly okay. Uh, I am not a fan of having to pay for parking. I have or parking that I don't use. My house that I live at has two parking spaces, and we are required to have them. Uh, that's money coming out of my pocket that I have no use for that I'd rather be spending on savings or you know, going out and spending it on a local businesses, but I'm forced to spend that money on parking instead. Uh, I, we heard some concerns about, will we still have any parking? Uh, I think the project that's proposed at the Food Bin and Herb Room is a pretty good case study of the impacts this might have on the city. Uh, right now, they are taking advantage of AB 2097 and cutting down the amount of required parking to just, I believe, six or eight, it's an even number. In any case, uh, they still have EV parking and they still have ADA parking, as is currently required under the city ordinance. I, I did ask them, though, about this. If this were to go into effect as staff recommended it, would they build zero parking? And their answer was no. They would keep the parking that they have. And I think we're going to see this, except with very few exceptions, maybe in downtown. But we're still going to see some kind of parking. People still drive cars, and they're still going to drive cars for the foreseeable future. And the businesses sorry, the developers are still gonna build parking for those people. It may not be as much parking, but it'll be enough parking to meet the needs of the businesses that are building. Uh, and just to close up, again, with the impact on parking, if we're building housing for people who don't have cars and encouraging people to not own cars, that's not going to make traffic worse. It's not going to make parking worse. It's going to make it better for those who do use cars and it'll make housing and life cheaper for those who don't. So thank you, staff. I hope you will move forward with what staff has recommended. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Bush, next one. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor. Um, this is Eric Rodberg. As a driver of an EV that is not a Tesla, I can tell you one of the big frustrations is that uh, folks who drive uh, gas cars or even sometimes folks who drive electric cars will park in charging stalls and not plug in. It's just a convenient parking spot for them. And uh, the only really viable fast charger for non-Tesla cars in Santa Cruz is the six stall Electrify America station in front of Trader Joe's. And that is often the case here. I was there last night, there was a Toyota uh, pickup truck parked in one of the stalls. And there's a vehicle called, it's a section 22511 that allows a um, private owner to tow cars in electric uh, charging stalls when they're not charging. Um, so, but they don't do it because, you know, 
they don't want to get their customers mad. So if there's some way you could make that a condition of approval of projects and or just um, somehow city staff talk to building owners and say, look, this is really important. You need to enforce just like you would a disability spot. You can't have, you can't be parked there. And people respect that. They know mo mo very few people who don't have disabled plates will park in a disabled spot, even on a private lot. But that's not true with EV charging stalls. And, and I can tell you that is one of the big problems with EV adoption is really a, a lack of chargers. So if we're also going, if you're going to go to this model in the state's requirement, requiring it where we have fewer spaces, and then you're gonna have even fewer opportunities to charge at home, you're gonna need these public charging spaces. So once again, that's vehicle code section 22511. Um, the subsection that's applicable is if posted in accordance with subdivision such and such, the owner or person, person in lawful possession of a privately owned or operated off-street parking facility after notifying the police or sheriff's department may cause the removal of a vehicle from a stall, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, if the vehicle is not connected for electric charging purposes. So um, if there are other tools available, that would be great. But I think that's a really important thing that we need to start enforcing and it will be a small piece of the puzzle of this parking issue that you guys are discussing now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ms. Bush, our next one. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Candace Brown from the Transportation Public Works Commission. Um, I really appreciate the robust discussion of the city council that you're really taking this issue seriously because it is very impactful. Um, one thing that hasn't been addressed is the maps themselves, which are key to this discussion. Um, the maps are actually produced by AMBAG, and originally the maps showed quality transit from downtown to the university, and suddenly in December, the new maps that were fed into the G, uh, GPS system, um, the GIS system, changed it so that only the east side had quality transit, even though the metro hadn't changed anything, and for future, the west side and downtown, which makes absolutely no sense when you actually know the number of people going up to the university and, of course, the metro downtown. So I sent a note to um, transportation about that and have not received a response back about why that actually flipped and was actually questioning where the maps themselves were accurate. Because those are directly tied to um, 2097. I also want to mention that on the east side, they are particularly impacted because there is no parking garages, and they are also at the same time being assigned for high density along Soquel, Water, Ocean, and part of Mission. And so it will impact commercial, and it will impact the neighborhood community businesses along there. Uh, without any parking, I don't really know how they could survive. Um, as far as making arguments, um, I, I would find many reasons to make arguments based on the demographics of our town, based on um, 12 to 13 percent being over 65, and I'm sure a higher number being handicapped, that the need for parking. And it would be naive to suggest that the developer should be left to decide about parking, when in fact we have seen projects where we had to convince developers to change their policy in parking when we showed that the impacts would be significant in the surrounding neighborhood, as was the case of 708 Water Street. They decided to do one parking space off street and that parking space is full, and that's very low income and disabled parking for caregivers. And um, I really do feel that parking is an equity um, issue and that um, lower income people should not be penalized. At the same time, car free occupants should not be penalized for using a unit without associated parking. I recommend you look at and introduce into the public record uh, Rick Hyman's letter of April 11th at 12.30 p.m sent to the city council on this issue. His recommendations are so spot on. I couldn't agree with it more. He actually talks about the full impacts, um, the concern about people parking in sidewalks, intersections, driveways, um, and that you should really assure that before you make any changes to anything outside the state law, that you consider many different issues having to do with workers, not putting the load of parking onto the public, um, as frankly has been seen downtown with um, Pacific Station uh, South and North, 
um, one of the arguments made for the parking garage. So I end my time, but thank you for the consideration and please do not include, uh, do not take out any of the exclusions with the law. Just keep with the law as it is right now and move forward. That's what you have to do by state law. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Ms. Bush, another person online. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, uh, yeah, this is Barrett. Hey, uh, this is an incredibly sad day that the government is so hell-bent to eliminate liberty in this country. There's no more free and freedom than travel, and you and the state want to take it away. As you admit, if there was free ample parking everywhere, everybody'd want it. As you know, what you should be all about is providing the people what they want, need, and are willing to pay for. You and the state's false opinions about this are tyranny as usual powered by the climate change catch-all justification for any and all removal of freedom. Neighborhoods with no cars is just an indication of poverty, not a desire to walk and bike. Just like the two weeks to flatten the curve, that wasn't good enough. Just like getting two COVID shots wasn't good enough. Just getting EV cars, now even that's not good enough. Without freedom of travel, this becomes a jail. That seems the plan for the inmates. Thanks. Thank you. One more, Ms. Bush? One more. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good evening, or uh, good evening for me. This is Peter Bichy at Community Liaison. Sorry if I don't make a whole lot of sense. It's 2.30 in the morning here in Barcelona, Spain. Uh, where, as you know, in Europe, share, um, a, a share biking and share scooters is huge. Um, I wasn't sure, but it seems to me when I was hearing from staff uh, the map, and I guess also maybe addressed by the previous caller, I wasn't sure if uh, Beach Flat is and Lower Ocean is included or not in the ordinance, but obviously Beach Flat having such a hard uh, parking issue or uh, you know, where there's too many cars and very narrow streets, it would be very important to have, uh, obviously, beach flat being included. I really like as well during staff presentation uh, uh, to use the pump station of kind of like awareness about the, about the bikes with their tools, which can be used by many people. And it would be ideal to see one of those uh, pumping tool stations in beach flat uh, park and another one maybe in Poets Park or something like that. Um, but then also I do remember when, and maybe I'm jumping too much in the wagon on that issue, but uh, since we're, we're talking about having bike sharing again be activated uh, in the city, uh, which um, really, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great uh, great way of trans transporting. However, I remember pre-COVID when uh, jump bikes uh, were around, there were lots of bikes who were just uh, abandoned Pretty much everywhere here and there in the in the in the in the sidewalks and the sidewalks are already very narrow. There is no wheelchair access, so the few people on wheelchair was constantly being blocked and asking people to move those bikes. And in Europe, for example, in Paris and in Spain, when you use your bike chair, you have to put it in a in a station specifically. If not, you get a thirty euro fine, which is like you know, ten times what you you pay for it. In France, uh, the scooters have been prohibited now in Paris because of that issue. People would borrow them or not use them and then just swat them and dump them anywhere. And there were just so many that eventually they said only private scooters are allowed, not the share ones. Uh, so just like in thinking ahead, it would be great that if we're going to have, uh, when we have bike share, that you have make sure that they go back to their stations and maybe include them in those stations as well in beach flat, but also uh, to have then like you know a, a return so people who avoid you know jump uh, leaving the bikes uh, uh, abandoned to just have you know uh, having a certain fine and maybe use those fines then to you know uh, for goods for the city and other than that so that's about it and uh, thank you very much Bye -bye. thank you so much for calling in and staying up so late to give us your thoughts we very much appreciate that that shows a pretty serious level of commitment Anyone else, Ms. Bush? We have Anyone no else who's with us wish to make comment? Matter is back before the city council. A motion would be in order. Ms. Brown? Uh, so I'd like to move that uh, we direct staff to return to the council at the earliest possible meeting with a revised ordinance 
that retains exceptions available to the city under AB 2097. Uh, section 658636.2B. That's in the, the state law, the, the portion of the state law. Is there a second? Second, second by Ms. Golder. Ms. Brown, on your motion. Thank you. Um, I am, uh, I was hoping to just ask for a revision to the, this, but I, uh, at, through our discussion, it's becoming clear that uh, this would require a new first reading. I am, uh, as others have expressed and members of the public have expressed, concerned about the uh, abdication of the, all of our local authority, and I think that there may be cases where um, it would be important to have a tool like this uh, available to us. And so, um, and, and I recognize that there are very good arguments <laughs> being made, and I recognize that it, for you all, it's a technical problem in operationalizing this, um, but I do believe that having this available to us is, is really important. Um, Mr. Butler, uh, you said, and, and the, there's a general narrative that the, the market will respond. Um, and while that may be true, uh, my job here is to act in the public interest and not rely on the market to make all of these decisions for us. So um, I feel that it's important that we um, retain that control, and that's why I brought it up here today. Thank you. Ms. Bruner. I just have a um, clarifying question on this um, topic, including the state language of AB 2097 in the proposed ordinance is is what you're asking for the mo in the motion. Can can I respond? Mayor, to that directly? Okay. Yes, the, so just the language, so including the uh, except, exceptions that are available to us. So not directly as it's written in the state law per se, but um, I'm not asking that it be included in there as an advisory of what the state law says. I'm asking that it be included as uh, tools that continue to be available to us. So the specific section of that law that provides for those four possible, those areas of exception. So I guess my question is to city attorney, um, and my, <laughs> I wasn't sure if you were ready for my question. Thank you. Um, my question is, if it's referenced in the ordinance, isn't that still available to us? Like, I'm trying to understand that difference. So I'm clear in, in a, an informed decision here what we're requesting in this ordinance. I, I think the way the ordinance is drafted currently, it does not incorporate the exception language of um, of 65863.2b. So as I understood the, the motion, it was to essentially add language to that section that essentially says, um, two, 220 is currently says off street parking and loading requirements set forth in this part shall not apply to A, AG, or B development within one half mile of a major transit stop. But adds the, adds the um, qualifier that the exception shall not apply to any lodging use. And I understood the motion to mean that language would be added to the effect that the exception would not apply to any lodging use or where the city's authorized to um, enforce minimum auto park parking requirements by section 65863.2b. So then, should it choose to do so? So then, my my follow up question is: My understanding is there are no examples of where that would apply in the residential uh, realm. So, it. Uh, I, okay. Well, I, 
I will say that's not what I heard. I heard that there are few. I didn't hear them say there are none. The other thing I heard, just as if we can colloquy here for a second, is that the reason I'm interested in this, had Ms. Brown not made that, I would have asked that we do that. My thinking on this is uh, we're, we're adopting a local ordinance to operationalize a state statute. That it is, in my view, the state statute is an overreach. The degree to which the state statute contains any kind of relief valve that either we, as a legislative body, in proving something, want to want to avail ourselves of, or somebody else wants to avail themselves of it, I don't want them to have to go search in the state law for it. If they're looking at our ordinance about what are the parking authorities here that we have, discretionary authority that we have, let's make sure they can read that in our ordinance. That, that is the world we are contained in, but there are in fact some circumstances under which parking can be required. Uh, that's what at least I was interested in having that not referenced, but instead included in our ordinance. That was my thinking on it. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? Mr. Butler? Thank you, Mayor Keeley. I'm guessing you're not just there to hang around at the podium. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Um, I, I wanted to clarify, I, I do not see any instances in which um, we could apply this to residential. So I want to be clear about that, but it could apply to commercial. Yes. I also would say that if it is the will of the council, I think that we could um, specify the exact language now and avoid the need for a second reading if the council is of the opinion that um, they would like to incorporate make sure this we can language. Do that. I suspect you're correct. I'm going to make sure you know, we can amend we can amend the ordinance here. Yes. As long as we have the specific language, then we can adopt it. Because this is the first reading, now is the opportunity to make changes. Make those changes. Yeah. It's coming back anyway. It will come back if you right. make changes today. It will come back as amended. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, my, would you would you like me to? Well, let me see if what we can do. Can I ask you about your motion for a moment here? Uh, my thought is that we would include sixty five eight sixty three point two A B C. All of the above. Yeah. All of it. Okay. Uh, rather than sort of pulling something out of it. That, that it would be in its entirety there, not the entire statute, but this portion. That is, I'm amenable to that, and I'm happy to amend the motion to um, request or to to Direct. recommend the the staff recommendation with the addition of that language. Then we get, I think, where you want to go. If we go. can, if we can then do that the legally. Language. Now we don't so have to refer. To be it. clear here. The exception language is exclusively within subdivision B of that section. Mm -hmm. A and C are the are the limitations yes. imposed by the state. Understood. Staff. And and my my interest in that is that A and C provide you the context in which B allows you to have exemptions under some ex un, under some circumstances. Well, I think that that sandwich, so to speak, <laughs> makes sense to put in. I think that's a preference call here. Yeah, but, that is but, that yeah, is a council preference. I'm, two ways to do it would be to simply incorporate the language of just to invoke six five eight three six five eight six three point two B. Another way to do it would be to paste that language from the statute into the code. So that's a council preference. Yeah, and I think that uh, I would prefer the language in rather than by reference because that's where you get into this thing now you have to go to the code and in that event i would suggest that we bring it back for a second reading very good i'll retract that amended motion say it again i i guess i'll ret i'll retract my amendment uh, and and would then stick with the original motion which was to ask staff to return to council with an amended ordinance that incorporates the language from s section 
Fix 3.2 of AB 2097. Is there a second? A second by the vice mayor. Debate or discussion? I have a question. So what, what's the alternative that would have us have this be the first reading? The alternative is just to reference it? And the only reason I say that is that if we're going to cut and paste language from the code, I want to make sure that it makes sense in the context of the whole ordinance. Otherwise, the alternative would be to simply incorporate by reference 65863.2b. Right. So that's the alternative is to, to right. just reference it. That's right. The specific language would be this exception shall not apply to lodging use or where the city is authorized to enforce minimum auto parking requirements pursuant to subdivision B of government code section 65863.2. I see, okay. So it would require the reader to do the additional homework of looking up the statute. And, and was that what you were going to recommend or propose? I, I was gonna say if we're only incorporating section B, it fits cleanly within that exceptions part of our code that we referenced. But if the council wants to do A through D, then I would recommend bringing it back so we can integrate it in better. I don't think that just dropping A through D from the state code into that exceptions part um, fits cleanly. And um, so um, if that's the will of the council, then I would agree with the city attorney and say bring it back. If the council wants to just reference uh, subsection B of the state code, then we could make this the first reading, drop it into that exception section as written, and I think we would be so, okay there. And if I may just ask my colleagues here, so the, the benefit of, of um, putting the language in there is, is so that the reader doesn't go back to it? That's my thought. Yes. Yeah. I mean... I, my preference would be to reference it and have the first reading today uh, because I, I see references to other state codes quite often in local ordinances mm -hmm. um, because I think we have discussed it pretty thoroughly. Um, I'm not sure, but it seems like we're fairly on the same page. So my preference is to reference it um, as we do with many other local ordinances. But, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get upset if we don't do it that way, so. Okay. Ms. Brown. I am seeing a nod from my second on this motion uh, that uh, uh, Vice Mayor Golder is also in agreement. There or seems to believe that it would be uh, prudent to move forward today. Um, I recognize, Mayor, the challenge here, and it comes up often, especially when it comes to planning uh, code. And um, But I do think that if there's an interest in moving this forward quickly, we we should do that today, and I'm, I'm willing to make that as my motion, so I will return to my first <laughs> amend, amended motion and say I, that I'm, I'm asking for, that uh, we uh, adopt uh, on a first reading the ordinance with the inclusion of 65863.2b in section 24.12.220 of the city code. Second. Motion and a second. Quick question, Mr. Butler, is that where you would like us to place that? You've identified the appropriate places. That's us. correct. I just want to make sure under uh, sure. 24.12.220. Yeah. Yeah. Right there? Good. We can okay. reference it there and, and make this the first reading. All right. We all good yep. for the debate or discussion? May I make one more comment? Please. Uh, because I, I do think that the concern that you've raised, Mayor, is an important one, and I know it's not uh, for up for discussion today, but um, I would love to see some way, space for uh, talking through how to make these documents more accessible to our the public, uh, where we provide references, if not the language, maybe links, things like that. So I just would love to talk about that at another point in our work plan program. Thank you. For the debater discussion, two comments. One is uh, planning staff, thank you very much. Uh, this is a, this is not a minor step in some direction. This is a very significant piece of state legislation that's going to have, I think, profound effects on every 
local government jurisdiction. You've done a very good job on, on the staff report and in the presentation today. I thank you for that. My issue is not with you. It's, as, it's with the legislature and the governor. I think this is a poorly drafted piece of legislation which overreaches tremendously and I predict that within a single number digit of years, maybe one or two or three, they're going to find themselves amending this statute. Uh, I think the vast overreach. I think that uh, uh, I understand what they think they're doing on this. Uh, I, I do think that there's an unfortunate aspect of this, which is among others with this. I get what they're the fines and declares are in this. I get what they are declaring they are trying to do here, and I don't have a bunch of heartache over what they're trying to do here. I think they're making a lot of assumptions about consumer behavior uh, immediately, like today, <laughs> tomorrow, next year, when we have issues in front of us. I think they're making vast assumptions that are unproven so far. I think what w is likely to happen, and I think Mr. Butler uh, referenced it accurately, I think that what you will see is that the private sector will base its decision on parking based on what they believe to be market choices and, and responding to a market. Uh, I, I think what will happen in that is that they will, if they choose to do any parking, they will do what they believe enough parking is. If they're wrong on that, what's going to happen is that the profits get privatized and the problem gets socialized. That's what's going to happen here. We're going to end up being the ones that are going to be under pressure to find public money to build whatever inadequacy the public perceives there to be in the parking space in that issue. Uh, so we will pass this. We really don't have choices. This is how we operationalize a state law. We all swore that we would uphold that, and we will uphold that. That doesn't mean we have to agree with it all. The clerk will call the roll. Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Colin Torrey Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Thank you all very much for your excellent work today. We're on item 17. This is an appointment to the Planning Commission. I, I nominate John McKelvey. There's a motion for Mr. McKelvey. Is there a second? Second, second by Ms. By the Vice Mayor. Are there other nominations? Ms. Bush, you're looking at me. Do I no. need to do something here? We okay? Okay on this? All right. Uh, are there other nominations? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk. I, yeah, I do want to just clarify this is an at-large Yes, um, we understand that. Yes, thank you very much, mm -hmm. though. Yes. Uh, uh, no further debate or discussion. Clerk will call the roll on the we nomination some, of John um, McKelvey. We probably have members of the public um, here to I speak, do. too. Please, let's hear from them. Good afternoon. Or not. I thought we would, but. Oh, okay. <laughs> we have, okay. Anybody with us? No? All right, clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Torrey Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion carries and so ordered. We are on item number Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> We're on item 15. <laughs> yes, thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, we're on item, item we take a five 18. Minute <laughs> five minute recess. Where are we all? Oh, my. <laughs> Sometimes. Not sure you're going to go home.
Following our early evening recess, council is back in session. We are on item 18. This is a downtown parking rates and parking requirement update. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm Claire Glogley, the Transportation Planner for the City. I'm joined by Heather Sawyer, our Parking Programs Manager, and we are excited to go through our proposed updates to the downtown parking rates strategy. Um, can you share my screen, please? Is it shared? Thank you, Ms. Bush. Okay, so we are in action. Um, this evening we're going to go through the background of how we came to this item, what the elements of the parking rate strategy are, the various scenarios that we considered, the work we did with an ad hoc subcommittee of the downtown uh, commission as well as the downtown commission, and get to the recommendation for a five-year plan moving forward. So to start and orient us all, this applies to the downtown parking district. On the right of your screen, you'll see a map of the district boundaries. Um, the downtown parking district was formed in 1956, and it's an enterprise fund. So it's user supported. The funds that are generated within the district stay within the district to fund all maintenance and operations and a bunch of other things. Um, it has the downtown commission as the advisory body to council on that. So we've done significant work with them to date. Within the downtown, we have reduced parking requirements. Uh, compared to outside of downtown, the requirements inside downtown are 30 to 70% lower. Uh, with AB 2097 that we've talked about extensively today, <laughs> those essentially go away for all uses except for hotel uses. Um, we do have a concentrated supply of parking in downtown. Outside of downtown, almost every single building supplies their own parking for their own uses. Within the downtown, the purpose of the district is for the supply to be shared, the city to supply it. Therefore, we have a fewer number of spaces that are used at a higher efficiency that are provided by the city and are uh, funded by user fees, mostly. So what does the parking fund pay for? I like to say all of the above. Uh, what you see on the screen, it is the people that operate it, landscaping, storm drains, graffiti, biohazards, all the public restrooms that are available downtown, our non-auto programs to grow Santa Cruz, sidewalk scrubbing, crusher washing, uh, support for the downtown streets team and the trolley and zillions of other things. So it's parking and it's all the things that help make our downtown wonderful, livable, and a place that we all want to be. It's very important to have this fund be well supported. So how did we get here? We last updated our five-year parking rate strategy in 2018. We are spot on five years later for that five-year update. Um, at the time of the work we did in 2018, that was the same time coming off of the council's work specific to housing and the housing blueprint subcommittee and community voices on housing. The goals that came out of that were specific to housing production, to sunset the deficiency fee, to fund a non-auto program, our Go Santa Cruz program, and to construct a new supply on lot four. We made many changes at that time to our parking requirements downtown and our rate structure downtown in order to make it easier to build housing downtown. We allowed for 100% of your parking requirements to be located off-site. We updated our parking in lieu fee, um, and we started a five-year sunset of the parking deficiency fee for businesses in order to facilitate the goals of the housing blueprint subcommittee. Uh, we had a great plan. Everything looked great. And then 2020 hit and COVID came. And at that time, we suspended all rate collection. As you probably remember, the gates were up. We weren't collecting uh, anything in the meters. We pressed pause on collecting any deficiency fees on our five-year sunset plan. And we had no money coming in. This was a strategic policy de decision by the city and by council to do everything that we could to support our struggling and floundering downtown business sector to remove any barrier to people coming downtown as well as to increase safety for the parking staff. We have a staff of about 80 FTEs, give or take seasonally. Um, this 
had big trade-offs. We were able to achieve the policy goals that we had to support downtown businesses, but at the same time, it tanked the parking enterprise fund. And um, that's one of the reasons that we're here today because that has lasting impact and doing what we're doing is, is not an option anymore. The next thing that came is AB 2097, which we talked a lot about today, essentially eliminates parking requirements for most uses in the district. So we had previously changed around the way that we did parking to incentivize the use of the in lieu fee, which ranged from $5,000 a space for affordable housing units at the lowest level to $20,000 a space for market rate or non-residential uses. We had tiered to incentivize affordable housing. That was one of the fund sources that we were anticipating coming into the parking enterprise fund to pay for maintenance and operations and everything else that we do. With the elimination of being able to require parking, we are no longer going to be collecting that fee for almost all new uses coming in. None of those uses by state law can have required parking on site. And so um, Mayor Keeley, as you mentioned, it becomes a, a social issue that uh, it is our job to maintain and provide the, the parking for downtown that supports not only the residents, but also employees and businesses. And finally, we're moving to a place beyond COVID now, we're calling it recovery or building and resiliency, where we need to dig our way out from the hole that COVID put us in, chart a course for fiscal sustainability and think about uh, the next rainy day that we may have and how to establish um, a better reserve fund in order to be able to weather those things. Right now, the revenue sources that come into the district, about 88% of those are user fees. So that's the money that you put in the meter, that's what you pay for permits, that's what you pay at a pay station at a garage, um, your daily rate, and it comes from our meters, our lots and our structures and our permits. We have other minor revenues coming in from um, rents in the, the spaces that we have in our parking structures that are, have retail and restaurants. Um, some from in lieu fees, we, in this we don't have deficiency fees, but normally we would, um, taxes and other minor things. But the, the big takeaway is that 88% of our, user f our revenue is already user fees, and that's what we have doing the majority of supporting our parking enterprise fund. Uh, this is going to go to probably closer to 95% with the elimination of parking requirements and the inability to recover uh, funds from developers. So what are the components of a rate strategy and what goes into this? We built out a extensive parking model, uh, parking financial model that takes a bunch of pieces into account. The first is <coughs> revenue from meters. We have on-street meters that have uh, multiple rate structures. The meters in the most convenient locations, front and center on Pacific, are the most expensive. The meters further outside from downtown are less expensive. The point of this is to incentivize people who are, did you not know that? Oh yeah, <laughs> I'll show you a meter map sometime. Yeah, I'll show you how to park cheaper. Um, so yeah, right down on downtown, uh, right on Pacific Avenue, there are, um, those are the most expensive meters. As you get further away, those are more affordable. Um, lots and structures, so those are both our garages that we have, as well as our surface parking lots, those have a lower rate than our on-street spaces. The point is that we want you, if you are staying longer, to park in one of our lots or garages. And if you're coming for a quick trip, we set the pricing higher on-street in the most desirable areas to incentivize turnover so there, there should be at least one space available per block space so you can make those convenient trips into our downtown local businesses. And this is in line with parking best practices in the industry. Uh, the next piece is permits. You can only get a permit downtown if you live or work downtown. It's an important thing to consider. And uh, we'll get into this more later, but permits are really our discount available for parking downtown. Uh, our parking permits currently cost $65 a month. If you were to park, it's very affordable, because if you were to park on an average 20-day uh, working month and pay the daily rate, you'd be paying $200 per month. So. Our existing parking permits offer a giant discount over paying the daily rate. And that really is to support our downtown workforce. So those are all revenue coming in. The next things we're gonna go to are revenue going out. Um, the first is a new supply project on lot four, and that's actually both revenue coming in and revenue going out. In order to fund that project, we would finance it. And so in our parking model, we do anticipate 
bonding for that project and all associated costs. After that project comes online, we do build in revenue coming in in the most conservative fashion possible from both new hourly and daily parkers and new permits that we could sell there. Next is operations and maintenance with a uh, new facility that does increase the amount of um, number of facilities and complexity of facilities that we need to maintain. So we did add in that increased cost. We also put in the uh, cost of personnel, supplies, services, capital investments that we make average at about $600,000 per year to maintain and expand our, um, our district facilities. And um, in this model, we began to establish a reserve fund for the parking enterprise fund, which we have not had in the past and that we feel is very important. I've grown up in like the series of emergencies that have happened. And so looking forward, hoping, hoping that we can get that reserve fund so that we do have a little more wiggle room when, when bad things inevitably happen. And finally, another thing going out is to maintain stable funding for our Go Santa Cruz program, which offers um, non-auto incentives for all downtown workforce and looking ahead to potentially being able to expand that to residents as well. So going through, um, in this presentation, I'm going to go through the status quo scenario and the recommended scenario. Your packet includes uh, the four scenarios that we did consider, but seeing that we got a unanimous recommendation from the Downtown Commission, I'm gonna focus on the scenario that was recommended and I'm happy to answer questions on the other scenarios. So what we're doing right now is that permits cost $75 a month, meters range from $1 to $1.50 an hour, or permits cost $65 a month, and we have a previous approval to increase that to $75 a month in FY24. That would be a July 1 change. Meters are $1 to $1.50, lots are 125 an hour with a maximum daily rate of $10. And the summary to this is that we have a negative cash flow. We will continue to have a negative cash flow, and if we continue doing what we are doing, we will be in the hole over $10 million in the next five years. The key takeaway I hope that you get from this is that status quo is not an option and we need to make a change. Which brings us to the recommended scenario and I'll, I'll get into how we got here, but what the recommended scenario is that came from the Downtown Commission is to only implement the previously approved permit increase to $75 a month to increase pricing on and off street by 75 cents an hour on meters that would result in 175 to 225. In lots and garages, it would result in $2 an hour. And to increase the daily rate in lots and garages from $10 to $16. What this would do is create positive cash flow in FY24, uh, both positive cash flow and starting to fund a positive fund balance. And we would be positive all the way out through FY28 including bonding and financing a new supply project. This puts us in an incredibly stable footing to be able to continue to operate and maintain the district that we have and to be able to do other uh, nice to have things that have been on, on the sidelines, continue our sidewalk scrubbing program, our downtown beautification and everything else that supports downtown. We did look at a series of comparable cities and the key takeaway here from all this information is that our um, user fees are pretty spot on our recommended user fees with what we see in Monterey, Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo, and San Jose. Um, some cities are a little more affordable, some are a little more expensive. Key thing is that our uh, permit pricing is significantly lower than many of these cities, and that was something that was incredibly important to the Downtown Commission as we talk through this. Um, we've heard big issues with recruitment and retention of employees and in hiring and that parking being one of the barriers to doing that. And so making sure that we maintained permit parking for employees that was affordable enough for it to make it worth it to come work downtown. So the work that we did to get here, um, there is a standing ad hoc revenue subcommittee of the Downtown Commission. Uh, it's currently Beth Carr, Daniel Nelson, and Joe Ferrara. And we initially had a, a scenario one, which you'll, you'll see in your packet, and they made that recommendation. Uh, they were mainly concerned about a loss of supply downtown, an increase in demand with the new development that we're going to be seeing and the changes in state law, and really wanting to maintain what we have and to be able to do the things that we want to do. Uh, they also wanted to explore future, uh, future exploration for additional revenue sources for other things that are nice to do in, in future items, but not today. So they made that recommendation when we went back to the full downtown commission and the downtown commission had a great discussion about this item. They really wrestled with it and they decided 
that they wanted to do a scenario 1A, the only change being we had had a recommendation to increase permits to $85 per month um, in FY25, and the Downtown Commission felt strongly that we should keep that at $75 a month as previously approved, but that we should increase the max daily rate from $10 to $16 per day in line with the, the hourly increases that we were seeing. Uh, they felt strongly that we should implement all the rate increases for lots and meters in FY24 compared to some of the scenarios that had a multi-step increase uh, because they felt that it was more user-friendly to do it just once. They felt like it would be easier on the business community to only explain it once and go through it once, and it would be easier for us operationally to just make that switch once. So they came very comfortable um, with that. I'm sorry, we had our uh, chair here earlier, but she had to leave to pick up her children. And uh, she was she wanted me to let you know that they are heavily in favor of this, support moving forward with it, are very concerned about um, the financial situation of the parking district, and can't speak strongly enough about wanting to move forward. So the recommendation is in your packet and on the screen here, it involves a lot of things to make this change. There are two resolutions and an ordinance that need to be adopted to move this forward. The ordinance would need to come for a second reading and then go into effect 30 days after that. The goal would be for these um, rate changes to go into effect in July to align with our new fiscal year, um, as well as our summer tourist season, and to, to reap the benefits of the increases there. It also aligns with when we're um, implementing the $75 a month of uh, permit increases. And um, a key thing here is this does really capture the changes that we've seen in state law and enable us to be on firm financial footing. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to you. Uh, we're available for any questions and um, anything I can't answer. I know Heather is more than capable, so thank you. Well, thank you very much for that presentation. Let me see if there are questions from council. I have one yes, short, uh, quick question. Um, Thank you. And my question is, and I think I've mentioned this before, but I got a ticket in another city. I don't remember where, Huntington Beach or somewhere down south, a parking ticket. And on the ticket, there was like a one of those codes you can scan with your phone, and I was able to pay it right then and there. And then the tickets I've gotten here in Santa Cruz, it's been a pain, and I go down there, and then maybe the counter's open, maybe it's not. And, um, and not that I'm trying to eliminate jobs, but it seems like that's a cheaper way of operating as maybe you lose staff through attrition or retirement or whatever, is to consolidate and make it more efficient in paying your fines. I can save a buck. Okay, so. Um, so I'm wondering, is that possible here? So currently we are actually finishing our last install downtown right now at Locust Garage. And once um, that equipment gets going, we do have things like QR codes and stuff like that going on. That's for the garage. Now, when you're talking about the parking citations, we will be upgrading our current enforcement program so that, which goes in hands with our LPR program. So we need both License of that. plate recognition. Yes. <laughs> and so with that, um, we should be able to finally accept some online payments through that mode. Um, that's part of our goal too, instead of just having to go in online through the website and do things that way or at the window. It's an extra plug to be able to fund our capital investment program so that we can move into the you know, current times. Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the presentation and, and all of the work that you have put into uh, creating these scenarios. I know it's a lot of work and you present it in a way that makes it look very um, clear and kind of seamless, but I I'm sure it's been a, a long haul. Um, I wanted to ask if, could we take a look at the table again with the comparisons? Because I thought I saw uh, one of the um, communities that was listed, one of the jurisdictions has some um, oh, subsidy for low-income for uh, permit holders who earn less than minimum wage. Um, it was like the city by city. Yes, um, here we go. So the, the, um, San Jose, it half price permit for employees earning less than minimum wage time plus a 30% increment. And, so, and that was really interesting to me. We have, um, as you know, a lot of businesses downtown that 
um, our service uh, jobs and, and the employees downtown who are not making enough to absorb these kinds of increases, and I think that many of them can and, and will, and, and we all, and we should, um, but there are people who, this is gonna be a significant hardship, and so I'm, I'm just wondering about what we might be able to do about that. Love that question. As Heather mentioned, we're currently updating our technology right now, and then we'll be testing it and getting everything ready. With what we currently have before the upgrade, we don't have the ability to do that functionally. The new technology enables us, enables us to have multiple types of permits, and our goal is to bring you back something in FY25, um, give or take, in order to be able to do that. Another uh, element that we would like to bring back is a residential permit for off-peak, as we're having more residents downtown. We know that we have more capacity in our structures and our lots during the nighttime hours, and we would love to be able to better utilize that. And so really, one of our next projects is looking at a variety of past programs, past and permit programs that we could implement. Um, so it is on our radar. We can't quite do it yet, and we feel like we've been saying that for a long time, but we're finally getting this technology built in, and we hope to be able to bring you back something soon. Council Member Bruner. Thank you. Um, Thank you, and thank you for asking that question because that is one of the questions that I did ask as well, and thank you for responding to some of my questions ahead of time. Um, and I know that Economic Development Department also is looking at the cost for employee permit parking, especially some creative models down the line for if you're a part-time versus full-time, right? And and looking at that kind of equity um, issue. Um, so yes, let's keep on that. Um, and I really appreciate um, the breaking apart all the components of, of this and, and all the scenarios that the commission looked at um, because I know there were a lot of factors that you know, you choose this, it affects this, and you choose that, it affects this, and and keeping um, it to uh, narrow it down to this scenario, I'm um, in support of. So my question, um, it actually came up with Vice Mayor Golder's um, comment. Um, Parking citations, don't those go to the general fund and not the parking district? Yes, we do want to make it as easy as possible to pay them, but they do not come into the parking okay. enterprise fund. We still want yeah. to make it easy for you. Yeah. Okay. And parking enforcement, is that also separate from the parking? I mean, the staff, is that part of the ADFTE? Right, so parking enforcement is mainly general fund. Okay. But we do, there are, is some funding in there from the district, of course, because they do enforce in the district. So the portion of that, of district funds pay for personnel and other enforcement tools that are used within the district. And um, my last question is, um, I know this is specific to parking district one. Um, what are the considerations in other areas where we have parking? I know the wharf is one place. Other parts of the city, um, is there um, anything the wharf there? Wharf is probably coming next as okay. we have that conversation. It's, okay. it's a little more complicated because it has to do with Coastal Commission there and some other stuff we have going on, okay. but okay. that's on our radar. Other parts of the city, one of the things we have on our work program is to work on uh, overall curb management, which okay. goes into lots of what you've talked about today of how do you manage spillover yes. parking, how do you manage increased parking demand, how do you manage parking areas um, where people really want to be and people currently are and that friction between what's here now and what's to come and how it used to be. Okay. And so we, we're considering all of that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Council Member Watkins. Uh, yes, thank you for your work and for your presentation. And I remember having the conversation about the equity permits, so I appreciate you bringing that back up in terms of how do we tailor this for those that need it. So it's nice to hear that 
it's going to be forthcoming and uh, obviously understandable given the circumstances over the past several years. Um, my question is in relationship to the meters and some of them being still only quarters. How many are those? And I'm asking because I've had a couple of people really upset, especially if they had a permit, came downtown, was trying to do some shopping like on Pacific, um, and I think right near um, kind of the Abbott Square. I'm like spacing on what that street is. Cooper Street, thank you, um, and 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 not having enough quarters and then getting a ticket, especially. So, anyways, I'm just curious as we're upgrading where that falls, and I think I forwarded you that. So, is the question just are there other options to pay the meters? How many, how many meters? Yes, and how many are only quarters still? And if there are other options, especially with some of the upgrades and our so, cashless yeah. society. So they do um, take. So, like our change machines downtown, they give out their dollar coins. Uh -huh. Dollar coins or quarters, all, all denominations downtown. The beach is only dollar and quarters. Um, we also have um, currently we have the ones with credit card right. on Pacific Avenue. That was a pilot, a long pilot. Okay. It's been delayed on making changes down there. We're um, actually some of the other next things on our list is to look at incorporating the pay, like the pay by space machines like we have on the surface lots putting those on street so one getting rid of hopefully a whole bunch of furniture as you want to call it you know decor downtown get rid of meters put those mm -hmm. they'll cover you know one on block faces that will have everything from bringing back the park card to pacific avenue which we don't have currently because of those particular meters um, Park Mobile, uh, credit card, mm -hmm. cash, coin. So for the ones that so, don't have any other options, I wonder. Well, we do all the other ones. They do have Park Card and Park Mobile, so you can pay by phone. You can pay with a Park Card or with coin on all the other ones. So on all the other ones outside of the, a few Ex on Pacific Avenue. Off of like Pacific Avenue. Correct. Okay. I just wonder if that's something to think about in terms of prioritizing more modernization of those and that we oh, are yeah. wanting turnover <laughs> and people don't have coins. And anyways, I've had several complaints about right. it. Right. Yeah. Another right. reason why this is so important because uh, the costs involved on bringing <laughs> true smart meters in that are cloud-based and all of that. And um, it helps with enforcement plus the, for the customers. Yeah. Thank you for Very making important. that connection. Yeah, I really appreciate it. For the questions, this will be the opportunity for a member of the public to uh, address us on this matter. Let me, if anybody is uh, going to come forward, let me reinforce what Ms. Galuli said. Uh, Jenna Lee Dolan had requested, who is chair of the downtown commission, if she could be the first person to speak on this. I think she thought we might have gotten finished with the other one a little earlier, but I want to. Uh, respect the fact that she did make that request and that request uh, was granted to her. Thank you for pointing out how supportive, had she been here, what she would have said. So thank you for that. Is there anyone with us who wishes to comment? Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online? Yes. Let's take the person online, then you're up next, sir. Okay. Yes, hello. You, yeah, this is Garrett again. Hey, I'm Good fascinated afternoon. by the ethic logic the city uses to justify milking the public like a cash cow in all sorts of ways, like parking, other fees, and its monopolies like utilities. I would note if I read this right, you are permanently really jacking parking rates because of A, a one-time temporary reduction in parking income during COVID, which I would mention you did receive a ton of COVID stimmy money that maybe you should have offset compensated that, and B, you haven't raised rates in a while, which really isn't much of a reason. And C, an anticipated reduction guess of in-lieu fee income from not being able to charge development parking in-lieu fees within a half a mile of a transit location, assuming there will be less parking development. I'm curious about in-lieu fees insofar as I assume, for instance, like the new street tree ordinance, if somebody doesn't replace a tree, you charge a $1,700 in-lieu fee, which presumably, I wonder, gets put into a sole use protected finance account to only and will only be used to plant another tree, I assume. Otherwise, of course, it'd just be a simple money grab. I wonder if in lieu fees related to not developing parking were put into such a special sole purpose account, and then uh, was it actually used only to service parking? Perhaps your finance director could comment. How much is in that account right now? Otherwise, of course, it'd be a simple money grab. 
However, now in this case, it is not the offending developer paying the fee, it is then to be everybody else being made to pay the developer's portion by higher parking fees to this end. And again, I wonder if finance could comment on how this money is to be precisely separated out, isolated, and its use tracked to the intended purpose of servicing only parking in appropriate equal amounts. Otherwise, of course, it'd just be a simple money grab. I fail to see the actual math disclosed justifying exactly the rate hike suggested, but in reality, I probably don't really, really, really want to look too close under the udders of government operations involved in milking the public like a cash cow. I also don't really get why people parking somewhere else should help pay for the library parking lot. Doesn't it, it want to be its own cash cow? Uh, you know, do you consider using parking fees for other than parking related services and end around voter approval of higher taxes? Because I kind of do. Uh, the ordinance preparer deserves an Atta Girl and an Academy Award nomination in the category of creative justification of milking the public like a cash cow in an ordinance category. Although from ordinance to ordinance, that is a very competitive category, including the child care development fee, the street tree uh, ordinance, green consultation, building fees. So it might not win, but yes, a nomination is in order. Uh, it might not also win an award because it is leaving some money on the table. I'm not recommending it, but if I were you, if you know what that means, I would demand paid registration of all city bicycles to ride or park on public city streets or lots and pass out big fines for illegal parking, confiscate unregistered bicycles with jacked up fees to claim and then go to police auction and sing. Uh, you'd have Jack Cola like Niagara Falls. It might even pay for public bike parking spaces instead of the wrong people, the car owners. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Anyone else, Ms. Bush, online? Anyone who's with us wish to provide comment? Matter is back before the council. Motion would be in order. So moved. I'll move the recommendation as presented by staff. Motion to staff report is moved, or the staff recommendation is moved. Ms. Bruner seconds. Is there a debate or discussion on this matter? Seeing hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkin? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Helen Tory Johnson? Aye. Vice <clears throat> Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Item 19 has been continued to our meeting of April 25th. This is the opportunity for oral communication. This would be the opportunity for anyone to address us on a matter under our jurisdiction, but not on today's agenda. Good afternoon, sir. Good evening, my name is James Ewing Whitman. I wanna thank the staff on number 18 and 16 for the diversity of how they presented information. I would say if I disagreed with number 16, I agreed with number 18. I guess enough said. Obviously I'm here because I, well, who knows, because I care. Um, I guess this could be a community service, you know, talking about the military weapons, which I can't really talk about, the transportation, everything, talking about the electrification. I wonder how many people that have Teslas are actually using um, EMF meters to see actually how toxic those things are. I mean, um, one of the things I know that are more toxic than driving in a Tesla is having your smartphone right next to your head or using earbuds. So I go to a lot of circles, and there's one I attend on Sundays, Saturdays, that's um, musical. The guy who's presenting has been teaching music for more than 62 years. A lot of professional teachers go to him for training. If there's 14 people there, it's not uncommon for nine of those people to be over 73. It's quite a fun group. He handed a article, or a little flyer that had eight articles in it, and I chose to read the one on Aquarius. <clears throat> or the age of Aquarius, excuse me, and there were just all these one-liners. Something I was reminded of is as Earth rotates around the sun once a year, that's our calendar year, Pluto rotates around the sun every 248 years. So it's gonna come around again in 2024, but 248 years ago was 1776. And I'm holding this citizen's rule book. Um, I've given away a lot of copies, particularly to youth who seem fascinated in the book. If anybody wants to look at, I've got six seconds, they can find a lot of great information in the basement library of the building. 
Nice to see you guys. I'm late to go somewhere else. Today was nice. Thank you, guys. Well, thank you very much. You Have a nice evening, sir. That's a plan. You guys, too. Very good. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Condotti, further business come before the council. Bush, further business come before we the We do have two, um, one person online. Two people online. Two people online. Let's hear the first one. Good afternoon. Yeah, this is Barrett again. Hey, I have 23 questions that I never should have had to ask about that $127 million down payment blank check water bond, but do because instead we got a minimalist, unsatisfactory presentation, and then we heard absolutely crickets from all of you. I won't recite now what those are, but I did email them to you as uh, there's no time to do that right here. Uh, this bond, unlike others, is totalitarian, does not require a vote of the people, but considering the price tag, does morally require beyond a doubt detailed justification as to need, proof of selection of a comparatively best project design, and a most convincing fact-based metric analysis that the resulting performance is definitely worth every cent of the cost, and I mean with data, specs, you know, like proof. The presentation didn't do that, and then you, charged with public interest, motivated oversight proxy, uh, you didn't ask or demand anything at all, nothing. Uh, note, sans a public vote, this is federal government-grade involuntary debt slavery. I hold the mayor more responsible for this information vacuum, as his is a policy of preferring council not ask questions publicly, even though they're a supposed proxy for the people and his demand of 15-minute or less presentation. The people deserve better detailed answers, especially of a monopoly utility. Uh, there was obfuscation in the water bond presentation, as in unlike buying a house, there was no truth in lending statement and never mentioned the total cost of completion of these projects, which I'm left to assume is $300 million at 3.9% interest, which is then about $600 million, 40-year debt obligation we will be paying on for the rest of our lives and half the lives of the unborn, about which my crude guess amounts to about four to $500 a year extra per average water user, which is about a month's groceries. I found the director's answer to the question of water rate hikes evasive, saying only rates will be adjusted. Most of the project is fear-mongering justification. It's now out of urgency. Note this is a very expensive insurance policy for something that has never happened running out of water. Please read those questions, and I think the water director should answer them. Thanks. Thank you, sir. One more. Ms. Bush? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Darius Mosinin here. Uh, while the progressives in the federal government are working on Medicare for all, do you think Santa, City of Santa Cruz could work on public um, bulky item pickup for all? What I mean by that is uh, units, homes, and apartment uh, complexes of four or less units get tagged, get free bulky item pickup. It used to be the tags, now it's a phone call. Five or more units, they don't get, there's no bulky item pickup. They have to pay like $30 to take a couch or a mattress. What is this? What's the consequences? They're setting couches, mattresses out around the city, on the sidewalk, and guess where they end up? Bench lands or whatever uh, plausible camps are out there. So um, how to fund this? Um, I've said this before in meetings. We pay a ridiculously low rate for um, the landfill. Uh, the minimum rate is something like $27.41. I took a load, a trailer to um, the Sunnyvale dump. They wanted 250 bucks. That same trailer I can get through the dump with stuff here for about forty-five fifty. There should be the minimum charge for the Demio Lane facility shouldn't be, should not be less than $40. I don't think anybody would blink. And I think we could do, you know, offer the bulky item pickup for the majority of, really, I think Santa Cruz, you know, or a good, a good chunk of Santa Cruz residents that have the same needs for disposing couches and mattresses. Anyway, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Ms. Bush, all finished online? No one else with us today. Motion to adjourn would be in order. Vice Mayor moves to adjourn and... Uh, Ms. Brown seconds. <laughs> and motion's not debatable. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Are you sure? Yes. Yeah. And adjourn. Boy, I love it.
Uh, they're playing at. Uh,